This is the regular board meeting of June 24, 2021, and now it's 5.08. We'll begin a roll call, please, Mary. President Lay. Here. Vice President Herrera. Here. Clerk Chavez. Here. Member Cortese. Here. Member Doe. Here. All right, agenda item 1.02. Uh, I would like to welcome to the regular board meeting and are there any member of the public who would like to provide public comment to the board on a closed session agenda item at this time? Yeah, none, seeing none. The board will now recess to close session and we will start around 6.30 for open session. Thank you. And we apologize for a little bit delay. Uh, we have a long conversation at a closed session. So let's move to item 4.01. I would like to welcome everyone to the regular board meeting, June 24, 2021. Member of public, please submit your public comment online by accessing the form on the district homepage at www esuhsd.org or the link on the agenda. Please limit your written comments to no more than 1,000 characters in length. Public comments submitted online will be read into the record. You may also raise your virtual hand in Zoom to request to speak. You will have two minutes to speak. Please note, all meetings are recorded. All regular and special meeting of the Board of Trustees and Board Study Session are streamed live on meeting nights and are also available for viewing the day after the meeting by accessing the district YouTube channel listed on the district webpage at www.esuhsd.org under the quick link section. The board is not able to respond to items that are not on the agenda or any personnel issues. The comment will be read into the record and will be direct to the superintendent and or the appropriate staff member for response. Interpretation of this meeting in Spanish and Vietnamese can be heard by accessing the link and following the instructions shown on the agenda and the district website. I move to 5.01. This adoption of agenda, uh, superintendent or board members may request that items may be removed from the agenda for consideration and or carry to a future board meetings for consideration and or action and or that the board take action in a regular meeting on a subject not listed on the published agenda on emergency basis or other basics allowed by law, Gov Code 54954.2. I don't see none here, none. So let's move to board special recognition 6.01 Student Governing Board. Madam President, this evening we would like to recognize the members of the Student Governing Board. But before we do that, I would like for us to take the time to recognize a former student. And that former student is Lee Evans. Uh, Lee Evans was an overfelt royal who graduated in 1965, um, went on to be an Olympian who medaled a person that took the risk of stepping out and speaking what was right for all peoples and very active in the civil rights movement and using his platform, talents and education to be a voice for change for others. And recently, uh, Lee Evans passed and I would like for us just to, to, as we recognize these wonderful students that have been about change this year in our system, recognize a former student who was about change in our world. If we could just take a moment to recognize Lee Evans. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move to 7.01. We are just getting started with oh, 6.01, yeah, uh, as we would like to uh, <laughs> sorry. recognize our, our student governing board. And I'm wondering if um, one of our board members who's worked with that uh, with that body this year would like to direct some words to the, those students as a whole as we get ready to recognize them individually. My goodness, I guess I should have thought of that. Um, 
it has been uh, such an incredible blessing and honor to be the our board designated liaison to work with the student governing board this year, uh, a role that I have uh, cherished in the past and was very glad to step back into it uh, last December. Um, this is the most active and engaged student governing board we've had. Uh, they have taken on real issues. They have uh, had the courage to really say what's so for them um, in this public space. And I am so proud uh, of, of you all and um, honored to be your, your colleague and fellow public servant. And uh, we're gonna miss, those of you who are moving on will miss you. Those of you who are coming back, we can't wait uh, to continue to grow and work and create uh, amazing things in our district. So we're gonna take the time to, to uh, honor and recognize all of you. Yes, we'd like to recognize you now. Some are not in attendance, but I know they're watching via Zoom and other things like that. So we're gonna read off every name. And I would like to thank this group for bringing up some very key issues this year. You brought the issues of consent and the need to talk about consent and inform others more of our Title IX practices. Thanks for lifting that up. Ed Services, be aware uh, that when it comes to consent and also the other issues of wellness, that they are looking to work act actively work as partners and that we will be in early August meeting to talk about how we could strengthen the student governing board, make that a more diverse group, engage more student voice, but also link student voice directly to school-based and district-wide initiatives. So guys, thanks for being willing to do that. And uh, uh, Paula, I know we'll be planning soon, but let's go ahead and recognize some of our, our student governing board re um, representatives and feel to either give them snaps or claps as we go through. And if I call your name, please come forward if you're present. Chloe Regis. Susie Nguyen. Tina Tron. Isla Hightower. McKenna Ma. Hey, at this point, Boyd, I would love for you to come on down and uh, stand next to our uh, student governing board representatives. Feel free to be right there. The team's jumping into action and moving the podium. That's fantastic. Yep. That means vaccinations have happened and photos are coming. Lindsay Chow. Tiffany Dang. Jenny Nguyen, Om Goswami, Jacqueline Barajas, Amari Salvini, Serena Tran, Caitlin Zhu, Leslie Mejia, and group, you're doing a great job applauding for people who aren't here. Love you for that. Okay. All right. All right. Harvard Nguyen. Lauren Mendoza, Joshua Andres, Isabella Duong, Paul Bravo, Elise Pham, Feng Nguyen, V Dong, Haley Henny. There you go, you even get shouts. Haley, here you go. Come on over. Thank you. Richard Castro. Paula Escobar. Thank you. Francine Estranero. Now I'm seeing somebody that I think we'd like to call up. Come on up, Stephen, come on up. Stephen, come on up. And we'll make sure that's, we'll check if it's either double. Yeah, we'll get make sure you get we get you your certificate. Not quite yet. No, not yet. Hey, Bruce, would you mind coming on over here? Uh, Bruce, Bruce has been an amazing um, leader within the group, how he structures the meetings and facilitates conversation. 
uh, how he listens to bring what student voices are raised and how you synthesize that and really make sense of it and convey it here, how you've managed to already put the initiatives out there for the, for the future and the crew that's gonna be taking care, uh, care of our district in the future. We wanna recognize you for this. So we'd like to uh, offer you this to Bruce Nguyen, Student Governing Board Chairperson for 2021 in recognition of your leadership, commitment to the students of Eastside. Thank you so much. Now hop in there and let's take a photo. I'd like to say that, you know, without a student, we will not be here. And I really appreciate all of your hard work for the whole dedication time for the whole year. And I know that some of you will have to say goodbye because you're going to uh, go on to college, but others probably will continue to be in the group. Uh, for our student uh, board representative. So I wish all of you have good luck on your education, career and future. Uh, hope that uh, one day we're, all of you gonna come back and support Eastsight and involve in the community and help education as well, help our communities a better place uh, for everyone, for the next generation. And I also want to appreciate the leadership of uh, our board member, Patty Cotizzi, as well as uh, board member Lorena Chavez has been continuous support for our board student representative. And I know that since uh, we had this board representative uh, three, three years now, right, Patty? Yeah, yeah. that's about three years, right? right. Yeah, yeah, so I, I think that is something that uh, um, we want to continue to hear the voice of our student. And that is something that why we are very proud of our student board representative. So thank you for that. Uh, any other board member would like to say anything or comments? Uh, board member Lorena Chavez. It has been a pleasure to work with you all. Not this recent past year, because Ms. Cortez is, is leading, the, leading the helm, just like she started it laid a strong foundation and continues to do the work. Um, but I, I have to say that one of the highlights of my term so far, or my greatest highlight has been able to interact with students like you all. Um, and just hearing that advocacy, that passion, don't ever lose that fire. Always speak, speak your truth and know that you have people, adults, um, and many others right behind you um, to get the work done. So keep up the good work. You have a lot to be proud of. Awesome. All right, any other comments? If not, then we move to 7.01. Uh, Bruce Nguyen, Student Governing Board Representative. So this is probably your last uh, board presentation as well as your last board meeting. Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, uh, indeed, this is my last and probably most sentimental report I'm going to make. <laughs> so first of all, I would like to acknowledge that this has been an amazing and thoughtful year for all of us at the district. And um, I just want to, you know, just think about everything we've done, uh, all the progress we've been making, and also all of the people uh, we've connected with. So um, 
to the class of 2021, we have made several amazing um, progress over the years. We've learned a lot uh, about staying inside our rooms and, and learning about um, different things in, in our classes, right? At the comfort of, of our own bedrooms. So to that, um, that was a really great accomplishment. So congratulations to uh, every senior that, that in the class of 2021. So, and um, with that said, a lot of hard work does pay off, right? And uh, students have been doing that hard work, but I would also like to acknowledge the efforts made by teachers, counselors, social workers, and uh, various other educators within across the district. And uh, all these high schools are, are making um, a change, right, to our to our next generations. And, uh, and um, Generation Z will definitely make a lot of impacts in the future, right? Um, I, I for sure will uh, be graduating and uh, will be considering all of the things that that my schools have been teaching me. So, so a big shout out to them. And also uh, in, at Independence High School, uh, I would like to shout out um, my activities director, William Logan, for being a very uh, amazing mentor to me about teaching how uh, schools operate, how school administrations, district administrations, and uh, various other organizations operate within across the district. Um, he has been very insightful and also very educating. Um, he's also a really amazing teacher. Uh, I've had him this past year in leadership, and he has really taught what leadership is. You know, it's about doing what's best for everyone. And I also would like to acknowledge uh, Independence High School's principal, Bjorn Burke, for also promoting student voices. Uh, over the past three years, I've known him. He's always been listening to, teach, to students, um, as well as other stakeholders. And um, because I was also involved in these things, that has also encouraged me to do what's right, to do um, to fix the injustices that we see. So to that, I thank him. And uh, moving forward, uh, my service in Student Governing Board has also taught me the value of communication, the value of leadership, and also the value of civic engagement. I would like to thank all the members uh, this year for serving uh, their stakeholders, their students in their own respective campuses. Um, in, in, the face of, in, in the face of the pandemic, we have done uh, a lot although we haven't really seen each other in person, right? Um, a lot of our meetings were conducted on Zoom and um, although a lot of us haven't really met each other um, in person, we have still uh, gained a lot of understanding, a lot of insight um, about how we, how we are as students. Um, so we are improving our educational facilities uh, inch by inch, step by step, and we are moving above and beyond to do um, what other students would want uh, to see in, in their classrooms. So uh, I will go over those things uh, after this, but um, I would also like to thank the governing board, uh, every board of trustee here as well for working with me and also listening in on about the things that we want to see in our schools. Um, and also a special thank you to our superintendents, uh, Superintendent Chris Funk, as well as the new superintendent, uh, Glenn Vanderzee for also being very uh, transparent about the things that are going on. Um, so with that said, uh, in the student governing board, I also forgot uh, to, to my fellow officers and colleagues, um, the, the three amazing people that I've been working with, uh, Paula Escobar, Francine Nascinero, and Angelo Hun. Thank you guys for helping me see some of the opportunities and also uh, issues across our campuses and for um, allowing me to speak uh, on behalf of you guys and, and every other student. Um, I, I, I've you know, really been touched by what you guys have said, uh, as well as um, what needs to be done. And there, of course, there are a lot of work that does need to be done um, in the future, um, I would say in the next few years. Um, so with that said, there are lots of progress and it's only the beginning, but I would like to uh, shed some light to some of the things that we have been working on um, so uh, I will say this out verbally. Um, this is pretty much a uh, report from our last student governing board meeting uh, on Monday about um, reviewing our goals. So out of the five different things we've been touching uh, upon, three of them we have uh, made a lot of progress on. And those three include um, having student involvement in diversity, uh, reopening task forces and IPC task forces. It's always important to have student voice in many of these institutions. Uh, and to give educators the uh, peace of mind of, of what students are thinking about, right? And 
we have presented all of this information and from the heart about what we need uh, to see. And also we have made improvements to mental health resources. So uh, through, through student involvement, um, we have been able to allocate or uh, advocate for funding towards, through, towards these institutions and also um, for access to social workers and counselors. And also we were able to promote equitable student communities. Um, what I mean by that is we were able to provide more resources to uh, parents and families about um, you know, the anti-discrimination policies and um, all of the other inclusive um, things that, that uh, students are learning about. And then also um, the other two is something that we can carry forward. Uh, we, want, we still want to continue broadening SGB platforms to student, school administrations, which may include uh, associated student body organizations, uh, parents and teachers within school site council, and also uh, staff that are uh, within MTSS boards. Those are some of the places that SGB would want to be involved in um, for the upcoming school year. And lastly, this is something that SGB would like to improve on, which would be uh, reforming the bylaws. So um, the bylaws is something that we've been talking about. It might be a little finicky uh, at times, but I, I will assure everyone that, um, you know, in order to better organize our groups and to, to better organize how we operate. This is something we're going to continue to talk about uh, in the years after. So now those are uh, the broad goals that we were able to uh, talk about and accomplish. Um, I will get into detail about what we've been able to do uh, throughout the year uh, across the district. So in terms of policies, uh, we have been able to successfully advocate for uh, the seal of civic engagement. And just a little recap, it's an award that's, that uh, graduating seniors can earn if they have uh, adequately uh, performed a service to their communities and, and performing a service within their classrooms. Um, and I would say, you know, for the class of 2022, you guys do deserve all of those uh, rewards because you guys have been, um, you know, talking um, day and night about the things that you've been witnessing. So continue to do that and uh, a lot of good things will come out of it. Um, and moving on, we also were able to have uh, more policies from, from the district translated. And uh, we increased the accessibility to four different languages, four to five. And um, that's amazing because more families will be, will be able to understand how educators are um, better addressing them. And next up, we, are, we have allocated uh, funding towards mental health facilities. So that's really great. And um, what I'm referring to is the new, the new um, facility at Oak Grove that will be something that uh, will impact our communities really well. And then uh, we also were able to um, talk about ethnic studies in a way uh, that you know, the state hasn't been able to do or other school districts weren't able to do um, as much as, as here. And uh, because of that, students are more aware or more informed about how the district is uh, going to establish ethnic studies across their school campuses. And then lastly, we also uh, improved uh, through student advocacy, um, the uniform behavior responses, which is how um, students understand uh, how they're going to be um, disciplined or how they're going to be uh, treated by other teachers um, in order to uh, better correct how they uh, are in classrooms. And um, those are some of the policies that we are, you know, we have worked very hard in uh, to reform. So, you know, I would just like to say a pat on the back to every uh, member um, in our district that has been able to contribute to that. Yeah. And then um, over, the, over the course of the year, we were also able to host events. Uh, and one of them is the mental health uh, town hall. I know that many uh, of the administrative members were also uh, attending that and which uh, it, can, it contributed to um, the progress we've been making towards uh, advocating for mental health. And also for uh, the student governing board, we were able to get together at times too. Um, that fall bonding event was something that was very vital uh, in, in the pandemic times, and we were able to uh, understand each other through that. And, um, you know, the progress from that is that we were able to learn more about each other. And, uh, and in the last event we were able to hold, or uh, in partnership with the YWCA, were the uh, sex ed uh, seminars that was offered to students. So um, by working with the nonprofit organizations, uh, YWCA, we were able to teach more students about uh, what consent is or how to um, understand these behaviors more effectively. And um, I would also like to shout out the number of, of 
organizations that we were able to uh, collaborate with, such as the Californians for Justice organization. They have also taught us a lot of information about uh, running campaigns, how to reach out to students, how to reach out to uh, school administrations. They have been very vital for the district as well uh, in terms of um, talking about how to start next the next school year. So they are truly amazing. And also we were able to invite members from uh, the Santa Clara County Youth Poet Laureate and also uh, speakers from SIREN, which is about um, immigration reform. And then lastly, we were able to uh, just increase student voice across the whole spectrum. Um, we had input in choosing our new superintendent. We did have input into choosing or, or talking about how to diversify our student elections, how to diversify student government board as a whole. And we are also having, uh, we, al we also have members from the reopening task force in IPC. So, um, you know, kudos to everyone that has been able to contribute to all of these policy changes and uh, advocacy events as well. Um, and on the school level, this is also something that, that's important. So the district is something that, that controls um, all the schools, but we don't really hear about how schools are making changes themselves. So at, this, uh, at the school levels, students have been uh, advocating for um, just becoming more civically engaged. Students are creating student advocacy clubs, student uh, outreach clubs. And you know, this is something that I was also a part of at my school at Independence High School. And that's how I was able to connect with the various teachers to talk about um, some of the injustices that have been going on, including um, the AAPI um, situation. And uh, it was great that there were a lot of teachers that were, that were also vocal about these things because we never know how, how teachers are. But because of um, our connections, our, our growing bridges to, to different stakeholders, we are now able to understand that. Um, and also, uh, we were participating, or we have been constantly participating in reviewing administrative plans uh, through school site councils. I know many of you guys um, sitting here have been participating in that. So it's really great to have student voice uh, in, in planning how different schools operate throughout the year. So that's, that's also amazing. And, um, and this, is a, this is also a really big subject that came up, uh, the fact of students holding uh, their public figures accountable uh, when they do see something or want to identify something to improve. Um, this, may, this may include what's been going on with school ASBs, um, how to improve conduct among uh, students and also staff as well. Um, so it's, it's always great to have students um, having conversations about these things. So uh, in accordance with UCP, UBR and district policies, we always want to um, stay ahead of that. And um, lastly, you know, we worked with countless counselors and social workers. Um, shout out to Independence High School uh, social worker, Leah Cohen for attending one of our student governing board events uh, to talk about mental health as well. And also various other um, administrative members such as Ms. Uh, Sowell, Ms. Powell. Um, so lastly, yeah, we did have elections throughout our camp school campuses. Um, that's, that's good on all of our campuses as well. Um, and that's pretty, much, that's pretty much it for all of the different things we've been doing throughout the whole year, uh, district and school-wide. So uh, with that said, um, it's only beginning, right? This is still, some, this is something that's, that's growing, it's tentative. Uh, it's going to you know, get better from, from, from now on. And I do know uh, because Glenn Vanderzee, you're gonna be uh, actively looking at everything that we're gonna be doing next year. <laughs> yeah. So um, with that said, Thank you everyone for listening to my report, which is probably the last report I'll ever make, uh, you know, at the dais here, <laughs> you know, and I've, I had the fortune of, of sitting here, um, you know, for a couple of times, a couple of really good times. I'll remember um, being up here and speaking to you all. So thank you for letting me have this opportunity. Um, so with that said, I would like to conclude my report. Thank you. Awesome. Yay. Absolutely. Excellent, excellent report, Bruce. And I could say that you, I've seen and watching you, you've grown so much. And I know that you will be the next leader in our community. And I hope that all of you, that this is a learning experience and uh, the next uh, student governor board will continue a good work and follow the footstep of Bruce Nguyen. So I'm open up for all my board colleagues' comments. Go ahead, board member Herrera. So I'm glad we're having another opportunity to acknowledge you, Bruce. 
uh, you've set a standard that may be matched, but it will never be surpassed because it doesn't get better than this for student representation. Uh, just your capacity to be attentive to the, to the business of the board uh, and to uh, hang in with us from beginning to end of the meeting uh, and to take this seriously. Uh, so uh, I, I long ago went beyond being impressed and just have been living with all, just A-W-E. You know, so I, I just know your future is bright and I'm proud that you're gonna be a graduate of the Eastside Union High School District. Thank you for your service. All right, go ahead, uh, board I, member Patty Cotizzi. One last acknowledgement of the whole Student Governing Board. I remember speaking with, uh, we had some consultants here a couple of years ago. They were um, looking at some of the work that the district was doing, innovative work. And um, for some reason I was invited to be part of those conversations. And I remember speaking to them about the Student Governing Board, which I think was about a year and a half at the time. and the person was just blown away like, wow, that's amazing. You have this, you know, access for a student voice. And I said, yes. And I got to tell you right now, I mean, it sounds great the way I'm talking about it, but it's a little tiny seedling and it could dry out in the sun, you know, if, if this isn't nurtured. And I am so heartwarmed by the commitment that you and your officers have made this year because this is no longer a seedling. This is a little, this is a sapling now. This is a little tree, you know, that I know will continue to grow. So thank you for taking it really to that next level. And that's all of you. That's all of you. Awesome. Board member Do, you have any comments? Bruce, you know how much I'm impressed with you. So uh, you exemplify what, what an independent high school grad should be. So uh, go Indy and go Bruce. And uh, I hope you do amazing thing at Berkeley as well, your future career. Thank you. All right, no more board member comments. So let's move to 8.01. Superintendent and board member may request that item be considered, discussed and acted on out of the order indicate on the agenda as per schedule. So here none, seeing none. So let's move to 8.02. Discussion and action to approve and adopt the proposed annual update to the local control accountability plan LCAP. A copy of the local control accountability plan is available for inspection at the district office. And uh, Teresa Marquez, Associate Superintendent of Educational Services, please take it over. Uh, good evening. Uh Board of Trustees. Um, if you recall at the public board meeting on June 3rd, I presented the annual LCAP update as well as the new uh, local control accountability plan for the 2021-22 school year. So at this time, I am simply here to request the approval of the plan as presented to you at the public board meeting on June 3rd. So moved. Second. Okay, Bruce Wynn, how do you vote? I approve. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, that's right. Aye. <laughs> Aye. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you. And I just uh, want to say, Teresa, thank you for your continuous like thoroughness and your presentations and thoughtfulness with everything instruction. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. You did a good job. So we don't have any more questions for you, Teresa Marcus. So let's move on to 8.03, discussion and action to adopt resolution 2020-2021-35 to confirm Eastside Union High School District commitment to fiscal solvency. Mr. Chris Chu, Associate Superintendent, and Sylvia Pelayo, Director of Finance. Please take it over. Good evening. Thank you. Um, this item actually goes in tandem with the next item that the board will be approving tonight, but as an assumption of the budget, uh, we are asking the board to consider uh, putting a future placeholder to ad address our future fiscal solvencies in the form of tonight's fiscal solvency resolution. I shared with the board last time that in the event that the numbers come in as they are now, um, the third year of our three-year multi-year projections uh, will will require us to make some uh, reductions to our budget uh, to the tune of about thirty nine point five million dollars, and so um, the resolution again tonight is just 
a show of commitment from our from our district and from our board and our community that we will uh, address our fiscal solvency issues within the next few years before that third year of our budget. And we will continue to bring forward updates to the board in terms of the budget. And as I said, and I will continue to say that this number will continue to go down as we get more 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 relevant information from the new year budget and as we as we move forward into the next three years those numbers will change as well so so again just briefly tonight uh, staff is asking the board uh consideration to approve this fiscal solvency resolution in conjunction with the next item the adoption of the budget so that we can meet our uh, fiscal solvency requirements thank you any just question the acknowledgement the that we um did see this last uh, at our last board meeting and recognition that this is something that we need to do um, because the third year out is a lot of projections and we don't really know um, you know we, we have to balance our budget based on what the state gives us the the numbers the state gives us which they don't entirely know this at this point either so um, this is really a placeholder and uh, so with that I, I'm going to move to approve second and I'll add the comment that it's a compromise with the county over fiscal oversight office that rather than specifying uh, which positions uh, would be at risk uh, for a reduction, uh, they agreed to accept at least a an overall number uh, and give us time with more relevant information developing to get to the point of specifying which normally we would do in January, February. Uh, but this is a, re a requirement uh, by the county fiscal office, other than just to take actions and lay people off. And we're stepping back from that. Yeah, this is not saying we're laying anyone off. This is just, this is a commitment from the board that we're going to have this 3% reserve. And like Mr. Ju said, we'll be revisiting the numbers um, with frequency. Um, but this is something that's mandated by us. And it's just the 3%, nothing else. Well, right. Well, it's the is 3 that right? with a specific number of potential layoffs. It, it's a commitment yeah. to reduce our expenses. Yes. If we need to, okay. to, uh, to maintain our 3% reserve yeah. in the third yeah. year. Is that correct, Mr. Chair? Yes. Okay. So that's yes. it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, any board member question? Uh, okay. Um, Bruce, how do you vote? Yeah, uh, by approving this, I'll assume that, you know, the district will be, uh, you know, we'll be in good hands, we'll be uh, doing what's right so that students don't have to come to the district again, um, like last year. So I definitely approve. All right. Um, Mary, you have uh, um, the vote uh, moved by board member Kotisi and second by board member uh, Vice President Herrera. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Uh, 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 Chris Ju, Associate Superintendent, and Sylvia Pelayo for your good work on the finance. I know that uh, budget is always in an important uh, subject that we all have to watch. And, you know, we're looking forward to continue to find other revenue as well as cut an expense as we need uh, to keep or uh, maintain that 3%. Reserve. So let's move to 8.05 discussion and action to approve charter school facilities use agreement. Oh, I skipped or oh, 804. Oh, I saw Chris Jew and I'm looking back, so I skipped that. <laughs> I don't know what I'm today. I'm no, sorry. That's okay. Thank you. 8.04 presentation, discussion, and action to approve and adopt the proposed budget for fiscal year 2021 2022. Mr. Chris Jew, Associate Superintendent, please take it over. Thank you again. Um, before I start, I, I do, do want to say my, uh, my, give my thanks and appreciation for the business office staff, uh, specifically Sylvia Palayo, in regards to putting together the budget for you tonight. Um, without her hard work and her staff's uh, hard work as well, uh, we certainly would not be able to bring to you a, a, a budget that looks uh, as immaculate as it does today. Um, as I shared with you on, on June 3rd, the, the budget and an actual presentation, I have attached to our agenda tonight uh, an updated presentation, literally the same slides as the last time. So I'm not going to take the time to go through them, but I did provide for some uh, viewing purposes, some pie charts in there that really kind of sum up 
really the entire fiscal pieces of our budget. So I won't spend the time tonight if the board, unless the board wants me to, but I just wanted again, just make sure that uh, um, I get a chance to say my thank yous. And again, appreciate the board for just passing the fiscal solvency uh, resolution. Again, re reiterating our commitment to our district's financial futures. Um, so with that, I will um, ask the board if you would consider approving and adopting the budget uh, tonight. Yes, I have a question. Go ahead, board member Cortese. Um, so I, I, um, I recall that the timing of this is a little awkward sometimes with the state because they haven't adopted their final budget yet, right? They've not adopted their budget, correct? But from everything that we have been hearing up till now, uh, we are very close to adopting the, the governor's May revision assumptions. And I even heard today that the 5.07% goal is probably pretty, pretty, pretty sound there as far as. So, so we're basing our budget on that. On the May revised, okay. correct. Okay. But as you met, as I did share with the board, within 45 days of when the state adopts its budget, we have an obligation to come back and uh, share with the community and the board, obviously any significant update to our budget. So at that time, we'll bring back a revision to our, our, our budget. Thank you. Any other question from board members? All right, if we don't, and uh, we need action to approve, to adopt the proposed budget. Move, move to approve. Second. Second. Okay, uh, Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. All right, all right, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so moved by board member Cortese and second by Lauren, board member Lorena Chavez. Okay, let's move to 8.05, discussion and action to approve charter school and facilities use agreement with ACE Charter High School. Mr. Christiu? Uh, yes, thank you again. Um, so tonight staff is uh, bringing forward a recommendation to approve a one-year facility use agreement with ACE Charter High School. Um, the one-year agreement is just to complete the, their current uh, charter petition term. Uh, ACE Charter will be coming back to our board uh, this coming fall here um, if we're going to con continue to allow them to operate their charter. And at that time, should the board elect to renew their charter, we will come back uh, with, uh, with, with, with the mutual uh, work with ACE to bring back another uh, facility use agreement um, at that time, not, not at that time, not to exceed five years either. So this is an effort to align all of our facilities use agreements with the charter petitions, yes. right? Okay, yes. yeah, that makes sense. Second. All right, Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. All right, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, let's move to um, 8.06 discussion and action to approve charter school and facilities use agreement with Luis Valdez Leadership Academy, LVLA. Mr. Chris Chu. Yes, thank you again. And similarly tonight, Luis Valdez Leadership Academy's charter petition um, is, uh, is, 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 uh, is, 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 is still approved for our district for one more year. And so, uh, the facilities use agreement for LVLA uh, expired as of June 30th of this year. So we are bringing a recommendation to uh, have the board approve a two-year agreement for LVLA because their petition goes out until uh, 2023. Move to approve. Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. All right, Mary, do you get the... Motion approved. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Let's move to 8.07, consideration and discussion and approval of waiver of facility use fees and waiver of total guest limitation and limitation on total time of use per board policy 1330. All right, Bruce, how do you vote? I would like to say that there is public comment on this item, written public comment.
8.07. This is from Julio Pardo's staff on item 8.07. I asked the board to make sure that the district provides adequate coverage for such an event. Based on the description, there should be custodians at the site from approximately 8 a.m. to 12 a.m., a total of 16 hours. With such a large crowd, there will be much to take care of during the day. Only, custo only custodians can do the work of garbage disposal and keeping the site clean per our uh, CBA. Volunteers are not to do the work of custodians. This would require at a minimum two crews of four custodians on 8.5 hour shifts, which includes a half hour duty free lunch. They would overlap for one hour, which would allow issues to be discussed. Thank you for your attention. Well, as uh, I want to say thank you, uh, President Julio Pardo, he also sent me this email uh, prior. He um, could not be here today um, due to our personal issue. And I just want to uh, let all my board members know this is the uh, 8.07 relating to the Moon Festival, uh, which occur in our uh, YB High School. Uh, for the Moon Festival, and um, that's why we were asking to waiver for facility use fee and waiver, you know, of total gas limitation. I believe that I already discussed with uh, um, our general counsel, Julio, uh, uh, Rogerio Ruz, you know, and already mentioned with uh, our superintendent, Glenn Bendezi. Yeah, so this request comes to you. She's not controlling any, Glenn's doing all the stuff, right? Maybe he is. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, just like to say that this request comes to you for our board policy. Yes. There are some exceptions to this in that, given the popularity of this event, um, Board President Lay is asking that the board also waive the 1,500 participant limit as well as the eight hour limit. And you'll see the time frames there. Um, You'll see that there is, it is free of cost to board members, except for that custodial overtime. And you hear Julio uh, mentioning that. So we'll work with the organizing committee to make sure that we follow the board policy and its structure um, to deal with any of those issues as it relates to making sure that our bargaining units are properly, um, properly addressed in this event. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, and I know that uh, the organization Bovinam uh, will work closely with our uh, district, you know, to move it forward and, you know, and they will comply with all the requirements uh, like uh, insurance and everything else. So uh, I uh, want to bring this one back and um, thank you, uh, Board President uh, Julio Pardo, that mentioned about, you know, the CSEA staff have to work during that time. So appreciate that. So uh, I have the motion from board member Joe and who is second? Oh, okay. oh um, board vice president Herrera. Um, how about Bruce? How do you vote? I approve. Do you have any other question? If not, all in favor uh, to aye. say aye. 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 I think just for the audio record, if you can just say you know, it's, it's unanimous or say, you know, Okay. Any opposed or any abstaining? Okay. Just for its clarity. Yeah, thank you, Board Vice President. So uh, the item 8.07 has passed unanimously. No objection, no abstain. Um, move on to 8.08, .08, presentation and discussion regarding single plan for student achievement. Uh, SPSA, David E. Brown, Principal, Mountain, Mountain Pleasant High School. Let's take it over. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Banerjee. Um, I will, I was already spoken to make sure that we keep things on time. So for the first 30 minutes, what we'll do is we're just going to, <laughs> not gonna happen. <laughs> exactly, gotta line things up here. Okay, Very good so, sense of humor, Mr. Brown. What was that? Very good sense of humor. <laughs> I try. Uh, so building equity, equitable communities uh, for the Eastside Union High School District and of course specifically at Mount Pleasant High School, where of course all students um, are welcome um, as they are. We want to make sure that the strengths and areas of growth um, are known and supported. And I know that you are well aware of this as the board members. So I wanna get right into the presentation. Um, if we could go to the next slide. 
The mission of Mount Pleasant High School is to make a difference in the lives of all of our students by providing an academically challenging, supportive, and of course, safe environment and to prepare them for college and career. This of course, just lines up perfectly with building equitable communities. But what's important to this is that we are the ones that are making a difference. Just a little bit about Mount Pleasant and its demographics. Uh, our ethnicity, uh, we have about two thirds of our population are Hispanic students, about 20%, 22% Asian, which means 90% of our students are Hispanic or Asian. Uh, and it's something that oftentimes people don't realize with small pockets, of course, of others. Next slide, thank you. A particular issue for the district and of course at Mount Pleasant are the high level and numbers that we have of English learners. Uh, at Mount Pleasant, 70% of our students come to our school speaking some language other than English. And that's one of the things that we continue to address and we've been appreciative of the support from the district from doing translations, of course, things that we do at the site um, as well. Uh, working on redesignating students um, as well as supporting those in their classroom. And more work, of course, still needs to be done. So looking at our first goal from our school site plan uh, that's coming under college and career readiness, I won't read everything. You have a copy of the presentation, but just pointing out what we're looking to do in the next year and so. Uh, starting with the first one, our annual goal is by June 2022, Mount Pleasant will increase the percentage of students prepared for college and career by 5%. That's the goal for starting for, of course, this fall. Now we were asked to do long-term or stretch goals. And so I have done that. And I'm being honest that that's what these are, long-term and stretching. Uh, that by June, 2025, Mount Pleasant will have a minimum, at least 80% of students earning an A, B or C in their core courses. That is English, math, science and social science. Uh, and that's gonna be you know, quite a task. If we're starting by 5% and then just continue to build each year, but knowing that a lot of work is gonna to need to be done as we come back in the fall, of course. Goal two, our graduation rates. By June, 2022, Mount Pleasant will increase the percentage of students on track for graduation by 3%. Now that may not seem like much, but when we look at the fact that we're averaging right around 55%, for each grade level, the work that it's going to take to increase at each grade level is gonna be quite significant. And we've gotta be honest that there's a lot of catching up to do um, coming back from the pandemic. Uh, so we're going back to where we were pre-pandemic, recognizing that we've got work to do and continue to move forward, but that would be a 3% by next year is our goal. And that hopefully by 2025, we would have a minimum of 65% of our students on track for graduation at each grade level. So that's two thirds at each grade level. Now, we continue to build up on that through summer school, cyber high and continuous work, but saying that as students are starting each year, if we could reach that level, that would make a major difference in where students are on track as we move toward graduation. For our third goal, specifically addressing English language learners, um, by June, 2022, we will increase the percentage of English language learners uh, prepared for college and career by 5%. Now, even though we've talked about moving the entire population, English language learners, as I said, are a population that needs additional attention. Our stretch goal being to have 80% of our English language learners within five years being on track and getting those same grades of A, B, or C in the core courses. I just would like to take a moment to say, uh, that's going to take not just work, of course, in the classroom, but a lot of discussion and dialogue. We talk about building equitable communities, uh, but and welcoming students as they are. Uh, what I'm learning is people, and teachers may welcome someone as they are, but aren't necessarily providing the supports to help them get to where they need to be. And every student, of course, has different needs. We need to recognize that and support that because that's why we're here. We're all educators. So we just wanted to kind of point that out. So I, um, just re referring to our suspension rate, um, by June 2022, uh, Mount Pleasant will increase its suspension rate to less than two and a half percent, 
And the goal would be to be by 2025 to less than one and a half percent. Now we know the UBR is going to be huge um, in changing how we respond uh, to students. I know oftentimes I like to use a term where some people react versus respond. And that react is something happened, boom, I just did this. I wasn't really thinking about it. Where if I take the time to respond, I consider all the things that are going on. Uh, one of the things that I can relate to, of course, coming from the classroom is not taking things personally, right? Sometimes a student just had a bad day. Sometimes there's things going on at home. And sometimes you're the first person, what maybe even the safest person that I can kind of lash out to. Can I hear that and say, okay, we got to address it, but we're going to address it this way. It's not necessarily punitive, but what can I do to intervene and, and help you get through this so that we can continue to learn? So uh, that's something else that we look to do. That is, that is really, really great. That is not to be underestimated what you just said. I think that's huge. So what, what are you doing to support the staff in being able to pivot to that mindset? Because it really is a, it's a, it's a whole new way of thinking. transform way of thinking, right? And so I, I appreciate that term mindset. And it is a process. Uh, going through the Vanso training was huge um, for me. It's still work, of course, being done. But the thing that uh, kind of rings true is about occurrences and recognizing that I have to be sensitive, just as we learned, right, to how things occur to other staff members. And the example that I gave, and I have been there, so I'll just be honest, I've been in education for 23 years, where a student said something and I'm young in my career and I took it, wait, you're not gonna talk to me that way. You're not gonna call me that name. And I'm just, and I've got to make sure you know that I'm the adult in this room and you're not. And that was my response because to me, there was nothing else that could justify or even explain this behavior. So it will take some dialogue, some professional development and then the district is being supportive of that. Um, and it's not gonna happen overnight. And as you saw in our meeting, it doesn't mean everybody's gonna have a change of heart and a change of mind. If it were that easy, we'd already be here um, and just everything would be you know, roses. Uh, but that is part of what we're doing and looking toward that professional development and those discussions uh, that we would have. Just kudos to you for doing that work. That's, I call that the work with a capital W. That's, that's the hard work, but really it's the game-changing work. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. And we're just starting. So I appreciate the vote of confidence. <laughs> All righty. And then the last one, of course, chronic absenteeism. Um, by June 2022, to decrease our absenteeism rate by 2% and um, to have a rate under 6% by 2025. And the reason that it's uh, labeled that way is as you know, as we make decreases, the target group that is having chronic absenteeism becomes more and more specified and more and more needy, if you will. As we're doing better and improving, that means those that are still left out, that group becomes smaller, but it also means it takes more intervention uh, to address that issue. Um, so that's something that we are looking to do as well. And that kind of comes back into play with having a safe environment, a welcoming environment, connections and things that happen in the classroom where students feel that, hey, this is a good place to be. And I've raised two daughters. Um, one did things the easy way, one did things the hard way. I'm glad to say, as you know, right, the, um, both of them have graduated from college and the last one just from Howard University. Um, but sometimes it takes time for things to kind of click and say, this is what I wanna be and what I wanna do. And I've learned that I could have been more supportive <laughs> during that time um, and more understanding and patient. So that has actually helped me and something I, I continue to bring uh, toward the teachers as well. And in having some of those dialogues, it doesn't always go smoothly, but just kind of painting the picture and kind of asking those questions. So you're asking me to kind of understand why you've done this, this or that. Well, what about when a student does this? And if it's just getting them to think, then I believe they made progress. And then the last slide. Just want to say that our co-ed water polo team went undefeated for the season and CCS champions. So in the midst of everything that was going on, it's always great to have a bright spot. Uh, any other questions? Any board member has any question? Board member Lorena Chavez, go ahead, please. I love these. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I want to start off with uh, congratulations on finishing this year um, in COVID times, getting to know the school under COVID. I, being a school leader is hard. It, it often, so much, so much. So just a lot of appreciation for, for all of our administrators and the work that they do, but doing it, getting to know your staff virtually, whew, 
what a task. So I just want you to know that we see you. Um, thank you. Thank you for this year um, and for moving the school forward um, in such, uh, oh my God, times that we, I don't know anybody ever thought we would experience in our lifetime. Um, and uh, with that comes, of course, my question, knowing what you know and learning what you have learned of Mount Pleasant this year and thinking about this upcoming year, where do you think is the greatest potential to take Mount Pleasant to the next level? Or what excites you about where we are and where we could be specifically at Mount Pleasant next year? The greatest potential that I believe is the opportunity that we have to re-examine why we've done things the way that we've done. Why we believed, especially when we came to this COVID, and I was a math teacher, and there were had meetings at the district, and here are the chapters, and here are the sections, and there's a website for what needs to be covered, and these are these are linked to the state linked to the state standards, and I would know. You will never use this in the real world. I would I had to be honest with my students. Matter of fact, the quadratic formula x equals opposite of b plus minus square root of b squared minus four ac over two a. I said, if you have a job and you have to solve a quadratic equation, you start to do that, you're in trouble. You need to use something like Desmos, just a website, right? Go in there, find the solutions for this, et cetera. And you need to understand that. So that's just an example of looking at why is it we're teaching what we're teaching? I'm really appreciative of instructional services, working with our SACs, and I'm gonna be working with the school teachers as well to look at the essential standards. Can we go more in depth and not just believe we have to cover something to say that we've covered it? Can we look at why we're teaching what we're teaching? Can we realize that we saw what happened in the pandemic that certain students, right, did well, they thrived. This was great. Let me go online, do I need to do, and bye. But so many struggled. And so the two things I look forward is to being able to build that community coming back and hopefully looking at why we're teaching what we're teaching, bringing that down to a, a more basic level. And I don't mean basic as far as rigor, but in sense of what is essential and what is important. And then giving the time for students within the classroom and during the school day to grasp more of that so that they're not going home and just sitting there struggling, but feel like I can do this. Can I just say that you light up when you speak like that? Um, so just a noticing, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thanking, wishing you the best. Not that you needed this upcoming school year. No, but I definitely appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Thank you very uh, much for your time. Well, thank you for thank your you. good really presentation. Thank you very much. All right. Good to see you. All right. We move to uh, item nine for well, public hearing. We have no item on calendar on this section. So we move to 10.01. Member of the public may address the board on a subject not on tonight's agenda. However, provisions of the Brow Act, Government Code Section 54954.2a and 54954.3 preclude any action as an unagendized item. No response is required from the board or district staff and no action can be taken. However, the board may instruct the superintendent to agendize the item for a future meeting. Any person may address the board on any item on the meeting agenda. Persons wishing to address the board must fill out a speaker request form via online submission. Your comment will be read out loud as a part of public meeting. Comments should be limited to no more than 1,000 characters in length. You may also raise your virtual hand in Zoom to request to speak. You will have two minutes to speak. I have a uh, uh, name of a speaker, Kevin Larson who is the parent and want to speak on item 10.01. So please step up on the podium and you will have a state your name and- Sorry, sorry go ahead, Madam President. Once you say your name, then I'll start the two minutes. Okay. No, you feel free no, to you introduce can, you yourself. You can stay right there. Yes, please. Yeah, we have Ready? two minutes. Kevin Larson, and um, I've been a little tough on you school board members, but I think it was needed to be done because there's so many things that I've pinpointed out in the school district that need repairing and so many things that need change. So I don't know if you read my emails, a ton of them, you, you heard my voice. And what I'm here to tell you is, um, I was vaccinated by the way, we, do, we don't have to wear our masks in here, I was told. First off, Mary G, I wanna thank her because I called over to say, where is the school board, where, where is it? And she was very, very kind and inviting for me. So I wanna put a prop there. 
And Bruce, you did a great job all year. I watched you on video. I really respect you. David E. Brown, another person who might be gone now, but what a fantastic principal, oh my goodness. Now, I wanna to get to the school board. I got two minutes or less, but uh, less than that. Um, I wanna tell you that when I went over all those things, those were symptoms. All those things I mailed you, all those emails, you know, they're symptoms. But in that letter that I wrote you, that's the cause. And in my opinion, many people have left the school district because they couldn't figure that out. They just, I'm leaving, I can't figure it out, I'm gone. So I gave you, with all kindness, the cause. And it took me like two weeks and I go, what is wrong here, you know? They're trying real hard, they got plenty of money, they've got all these people. And I, I really think I defined what's wrong. And it's gonna save you a lot of money and it's gonna make people really happy if you really dig into that letter and start analyzing it. Um, I think that about does it. I talked about the cause. Um, I know we have a lot of wonderful people working at the school district. You know, I wanna thank the school board for all they do. Um, I have other projects I'm working on, so I'm not gonna be like doing this all the time, you know, but I will try and help the students the best I can. And one last thing, last thing. I guess it's 1.40 right now. I think that clock says 1.40. You see it over there? <laughs> so if it's 1.40, it's just another example, you know, of how we have to really improve. If we don't get our clock running right in this school board room, it's reflection of everything here. And we have to have a little more general patent in here. And I know you all are wonderful people, but we need a general patent to show up and say, pull that clock down. I want an automated clock. You know, you need to be tough. And thank you, Mr. Van de Zee, for welcoming me into the school district. Thank you, Mr. Alvin Lassen. We receive a lot of emails from you. And thank you for the time that sent us on those emails. So, because this is the uh, public, uh, you know, item. So we're gonna move ahead to the next board meeting is 11.01, .01, presentation, information, discussion, and action regarding update on novel coronavirus, COVID-19, Mr. Glenn Vandersey. Hey, thank you very much. And um, I start this tonight. I'm gonna, we're going to go through a couple items or aspects of, of the return. I just want to be real specific about what those are. Normally, I don't walk through the agenda this specifically with you, but I, I want to start this presentation that, that way tonight. First thing I'm going to share with you is just shared public data around where we are in terms of uh, rates of infection and then where we are with vaccination within our county just so that we have that as a starting place. And this data comes from us from within the last week. I'm gonna share that with you because it then tells us where we are in our phase status in terms of the prior work with the reopening committee, they had phase one, two, three, and four. And I just wanna remind us and take us back to when we were operating with tiers and things like that, where we were operating with different phases because we're now in a phase four. I wanna share the current efforts that Ed Services and I wanna thank business services for getting dividers and you know, dis, you know, disinfectant and hand sanitizers and N95 respirators and all those good things. Thanks to everybody who's been doing this and thanks to our workers and our staff who just continually to bring it for our students and support each other in a good way. I wanna go over the current efforts. But then I just do wanna reiterate the four aspects that we're focusing on our return. And then quite frankly, share with you that we are in a holding pattern in terms of determining what we are going to look like in the fall as we are completely dependent and waiting on state efforts. That's not to complain. It's not to throw blame. It's to say when our parents are asking, what's it going to look like in the fall? Our answer is we are going to intend to have as many as the maximize in-person instruction to the fullest extent possible, given the guidelines. And what we're just waiting for from the state right now are what those guidelines are. And when we hear them, then we'll jump to, we'll use the prior input, we'll develop a plan, we'll meet with our bargaining units, we'll meet with the reopening task force, and we'll get the input to uh, 
uh, open that way. So let me just go ahead. What I'm trying to tell you there is where I'd love to be able to say this is what the fall is going to look like. I can't. And as soon as we can, we will. But for our community, and I'll be sending something out in the short term to our community once I've presented this to you, is to explain and to express to our community, plan on coming back for the fullest extent capable. Whether you have to you know, get your head ready, interact with the school, um, start looking about what to talk, or emailing your counselor about credit recovery, all those good things. But the, that I wanna point you to here um, is, on this is our current, test positivity rate as a, dis, as a county. And what's just really great, what great to see is our current seven day average is 0.4%. And I, if, if you're gonna write something down right now, it's 0.4%. Because when they talked about getting out of the tiers and moving into in-person instruction, that was a positivity rate, it had to be under 2%. So we're under two, we're under one, we're at 0.4 positivity rate, right? That's the first thing I just want to point to you. And you can see how this county and, and, and how our families and, have been affected by this virus to date, right? And you see the numbers there. This, this drills in a little closer. Um, this, this data comes from us from June 21st, which is why this last band is grayed out because they wait for the seven day to get all the data in. But you can see that there are testing, the numbers of testing um, continue to kind of wane as people get vaccinated, but that our rolling seven day average is staying pretty consistent now at or below 0.4%. So let's talk about vaccinations. What you see here, um, just in terms of the percentages, let's start here. We can see total residents 12 age and older with at least one dose. So in our county, those eligible, we've got about one point, I'm gonna round up 1.4 million, right? It says 1.37, let's just, I'm rounding up there. The percent of residents ages 12 and older with at least one dose is 80%. And you've heard about that magic 80% percentage that we're trying to get to. And if you look across the map of the state of California, there's about five or six counties with that dark green indicator that we're getting close and, and Santa Clara is one of those counties. Interesting now is um, as we get here is just the, where we currently are with completed vaccination is 71.3. So with the one dose we're at 80, we're currently at 71.3. So we're just encouraging um, people to get the vaccinations. And if you go onto the uh, county website and we talk about that, you can see that these bands have to do with uh, different age groups. You'll see the spike there in, in pink uh, when, our, uh, when the vaccines became available to uh, people at ages 12 and up. There was a quick surge of young people getting those vaccinations, and you can see that there. But the data I just want us to be mindful of, all of us, as we communicate with our families, as we communicate with others, it's just we influence folk, is the current percentages of vaccinations in some of our categories here. And we can see that right now, um, we, we looked at that, that first group, all residents 12 and up with at least one dose, 80%. But we can also see that percentage-wise across ethnicities, while Asian uh, population is at 96.8, uh, we can see that uh, white, African-American and Latino populations are under 70. And, and, and looking at our Latino and African-American population below 60, want to continue to uh, message out about, about vaccinations. We now get into a, a, an age group here that's kind of near and dear to the people of Eastside because these are our students, right? The next group, our number of residents ages 12 to 15, uh, receiving at least one dose, we can see that's about 52,000. Um, that's right now about 50% of that age group. But you can once again see the breakdown across ethnicities in terms of populations accessing uh, those vaccinations, getting that second shot when necessary. And so we just wanna to continue to encourage all of us to message the power of that vaccination. So these numbers I have to, we have the with residents 16 and older, uh, we have a residents of 50 year older, no one here qualifies for that. Um, and so the next data I wanna show, show you is just, you say, this is data, I go, yes, this is data because this next statement 
from the uh, county health office, just that vaccines are in plentiful supply, that demand for vaccines continues at a slower pace. We do need to continue focusing messaging and, and, and outreach. And that, the, and that people should know that as this plan develops, current county planning is pivoting towards private providers and retail pharmacies. Uh, if you go on the county page, if you look on our website, you can see that there's in our schools, we're providing vaccinations and we keep getting that message out. Um, I show you this data though, about the, the vaccine being in plentiful supply. And I would take you back to that percentage of 0.4 because when our reopening task force met during last year, one of the conditions for um, full person instruction was vaccine widely accessible. So one of those criteria wasn't just we're below a certain level, but the vaccine needs to be accessible. So I'm showing you these data points here because back when we were in tiers, um, you can see that the percentages necessary to get out of those, uh, get into phase four was below uh, below 2%, we're now at 0.4% as a county, and we have the vaccines wildly available. So while our current efforts are happening kind of in the mindset of that phase three, we are preparing for phase, phase four. So within phase three, which is in-person for some groups, you remember we had students back on campuses. Uh, we had about 3,000 students across our district met with uh, East Side adults um, and finished out the school year in small cohorts on Wednesdays and Tuesdays and Thursdays and Monday mornings and great things like that. And currently we are offering um, in-person summer school. And so we do, we had the extended learning opportunities and that was one of those novel, novel responses, right? That come out of this pandemic. And we'll wanna talk about next summer if we do something similar, which I mean, great staff said, listen, I still have some students who are failing my class. I don't want to issue that no pass, but if I can stay with them a week or two weeks after, week and a half, two weeks after school and get them to work to get that failing grade, they won't have to earn that no pass and go back and take it. So just, that's why we love Eastside, right? That adults would step up that way, that students would take advantage and that um, we have an ed services department that could coordinate and, and do all that great work. So thanks to everyone who took advantage of that. And now we're doing it with summer school. I, I put this back to you because we are now, all the data is essentially saying we're back to full person instruction. When, I, when we meet with our colleagues and talk to people across the state, they go, we don't know what the guidelines are, but plan on being back for full in-person instruction in the fall. And so we are building ourselves that way, but we do not yet have the specific guidelines. So if there is any kind of limit on a group size that doesn't allow one of our schools to meet or to have more than 2,500 students on a campus. We'd have to rethink a schedule for a school that size. Um, if there's any kind of rethinking of cohort. Um, there was some discussion early on about no distance learning is not an option. There's been some discussion in the state about independent studies, but nothing and then independent studies in its current form or different but nothing conclusive or in a way that we can definitively plan for fall. And that's, uh, that's really what we're waiting on. We have done, uh, we, are, we are prepared and doing a lot of good work around wellness and getting those social workers and all in, in adjusting our LCAP and our ELO, bringing on more bilingual para educators to assist in classes. But the current guidelines, even with the new issuance that came out on June 17th, the guidelines for schools have not changed. They're still the same. They're the more restrictive guidelines. We're hoping that they come out in the next week, but we don't have them yet. And so I say that to you because as we are continuing to make sure that we have the right protocols, the right, um, the right PPE for ensuring safety and that personal protective equipment, uh, for ensuring safety, we're gonna continue with that as our goal. And our testing has been Amazing, We've, we went into testing early as a district. Our rates of contamination, our, con, our um, people um, obtaining the virus at work is amazingly low, less than what you can count on your hand. Um, and so we've done really good work and I wanna thank once again, 
our, our staff and thinking of their coworkers about how they managed all of that when it was time of physical distancing or masking up or wiping down your area. We've moved away from that now for, in some of the current guidelines, but we'll, we'll continue to ensure safety. Um, this summer, when our um, administrative teams from our schools already met, there was an emphasis on mental health, how we're gonna get the message out, what, what wellness feels like when you don't feel that way, who do you contact, establishing more services, not making it something you gotta figure out, but something that's just known. What uh, we love to talk about in multi-tier systems of support is a common assurance. And a common assurance in our district just has to be, I have an idea of what wellness should feel like. And when I'm not feeling that way, I know where I can go. That, that just has to be a default. And our students are gonna need that more than ever as they return for very isolated or heavily impacted experiences to school. The thing that we'd like to be clearest and seems the most basic is what does school look like on the first day of school? And ironically, that's the one thing we know the least amount about, given that we're waiting on the guidelines. So whether it's a full return or it's a full return and some people choose an option because they don't feel comfortable, we don't know what that option will be from the state. We don't know how informed from the state that option will be for a high school and how schedules are built as opposed to an elementary 20 to one or 25 to one um, structure, or if we have to use some form of modified schedule, um, we'll, we still will have to um, continue listening and responding and building that out. And then the fourth issue that we're focusing on is just addressing learning loss and credit recovery. You know, I think we know that we have about more, about 9,000 more no passes than we would have had from a year ago, second semester. That just means that we're going to have to develop plans. Our counselors are great and glad we've got them at the numbers that we do to, to meet with students and develop a plan that allows them to continue to grow this year and continue or build up, whether it's recovery um, or moving, moving fast forward um, to make sure that there's no loss of opportunity in terms of graduation or college and career readiness. And I say, I say that to you, and I bring this to you tonight with also some understanding that we've had a survey open with, uh, with parents about just how they're feeling about returning. And it's still open, so we don't have all the pie charts for you tonight because we, it's in, it's in uh, multiple languages. And it's gone out. We've had about 4,000 responses. And in asking folk just how comfortable do you feel about returning to in-person instruction, it's, it's fairly high. It's about 78 78%. And then when the question is asked, if state guidelines allow for some kind of option that's not in person, 22% responded. But I can also tell you that that 22 is a, um, a group that's getting a question like if there was an option. When we met with the in-person task force, there's different feelings about that. Um, if I could get distance learning five days a week, I might be interested. If it's an independent study program where I only meet with an adult for one day a week, then I'm less interested in that option. Or it, so we will have to be a lot more definitive on what our option is um, to really know the, the, the demand uh, for someone that would set an option. But I would like to say, I, I will say this, that I'm encouraged by the levels of vaccination. I'm encouraged by our previous efforts as it relates to ensuring safe environments and testing and having the appropriate personal protective equipment that we are really looking and encouraging because of all the aspects and benefits in terms of academics, wellness, communication, mental health, addressing learning loss and recovery is having people back at school to the maximum extent possible. This would, it would not just be, it's my preference. It, it will be a, to be something of a demonstrated need uh, to opt, to opt out. But once again, we're waiting on those guidelines from the state. So I say to you this, really when we'd like to just say this is what follows, but really on those next steps, our expectation is to return to full person learning to the maximum extent possible. But what we're in right now is monitoring the state and local guidelines for school specific information. Not just can you go see an earthquakes game at the stadium or go out to dinner, what are the specific guidelines for school? We'll continue to um, use the current guidelines in our summer school planning, and we're gonna stay with those. Um, but we're gonna just make sure that we continue to plan 
and meet with those groups, whether it's reopening task force or bargaining units as we, once we know where we're going to develop the memorandums of understanding in terms of impacts to working conditions. And we will uh, communicate with the community as the status and next steps. We know that some of our districts um, around us issued some statements and now they're having to kind of walk back or sideways from them. Um, I, I don't wanna do that to our parents because touch points for communication are sometimes not frequent and it, you gotta make that, that moment matter. So um, we will sit, be sending out something in the short term saying expectation is to return full person to maximum extent possible, yes, it but is. it will be consistent with the guidelines. But what we're emphasizing is I didn't know Rudy Giuliani got his law license suspended. Uh, when yeah. did that happen? I saw it on the news today because when he was supporting the, the Trump and all that shit. If we could have someone uh, find the speaker and uh, mute them, that would be, thank you. Wow. All right. So let me just kind of go back 30 seconds. I hope it wasn't. We intend to return to the maximum extent possible. We'll do that with the within the guidelines. But as we do our planning, whatever that number three is gonna be about the, what the specific learning environment is gonna be, please know that we have conducted planning and we've added resources for safety, wellness, and learning recovery. Because it's not just about what your schedule is gonna be in the fall. It's how our community really supports each other in staying safe, being well, and addressing the impact of this last year. So I don't wanna just leave it as some sort of technical, schedule and programmatic work, that's our work for the fall. That's just one aspect. Um, we at Eastside are seeing ourselves holistically and having these four aspects. So I just wanted to update with you that tonight um, and let you know that uh, I'll be messaging something similar to our community and letting you know as the information comes in where we're, what direction we're heading in terms of schedule. Thank you. Awesome, uh, Mr. Glenn Vanderzee. I have a question that um, when does your reopening task force meet? Uh, we met and agreed to meet after the new guidelines were presented. So it's, it's like, hey, we're just, we're repeating though, you know, hurry up and wait or let's see, or it depends conversation. So as soon as we have those guidelines, we, we will be meeting. And do we have uh, any one of our board member will attend? Patty. Oh, okay, great. Yes. All right, that's excellent. I was wondering about the independent study. Um, are we going to take a look of this program a little bit further, just in case more students want to take the independent study? The, the issue with independent study is this. It's one, it's currently, we have an independent study program. It's structured for those students that demonstrate a need for it, not just a preference, but it's a demonstrated need to say, I should not be in um, uh, the general school environment. I need a specialized program. I'm, distance learning, there were multiple touch points. There was multiple days of instruction. What families would need to know that independent studies as currently designed doesn't function that way. It's very less time with the teacher um, that you have to demonstrate the need. And then secondly, uh, you also need to be able to demonstrate the ability to be successful in that program. And that's, that's something that can sometimes become uh, a barrier for people and we try to find another way to accommodate. We will have to see what the guidelines are from the state to see if independent studies is still gonna be defined the same way, if there's gonna be other aspects to it. But uh, the challenge for a high school district is once you have those students in their classes, there are very few students, and I'm going to use Bruce's example, and uh, we'll see. I would guess that when Bruce speaks to his friends, that they don't all have the same schedule, that the classes that they take are very unique, and the order that they take them is very unique. So when you start to get a, even a small percentage of students that might choose to opt out, that doesn't always free up enough staff from a larger schedule perfectly to do independent study. So we will be working within the guidelines, but also kind of the, the, the opportunities that exist within our system to be able to respond. Thank you, Mr. Van Der Zee. Any board member has a question? Uh, board member Lorena Chavez, please. Um, thank you for this update. This is super helpful. Um, 
I appreciate that we haven't put out a statement as a district and are walking sideways. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to cause confusion and already a confusing time. So just want to say thank you for that. Um, and, and in that same vein, uh, if the answer is we're not there yet, then that's perfect. Um, but how is the district thinking about messaging in a different way so that it, we, we are super clear? Because I think even at our best, there's still going to be people who are confused yes. or just the state of being might not be able to take in whatever the message is. So how, how is the district thinking about that? Well, the first thing we'll do is we'll just announce our intent for maximum return waiting on state guidelines. The other thing we're gonna emphasize right away is that we think schools are the best place for your students to be. And that we have, we're not just being passive and saying, come on back. We're saying we've, we're getting things ready for you. In but terms of- Through what means though? Oh, we're gonna to have to do, it's, it's not gonna, it's gonna to have to be through our, our phone communications, through our, 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 our Twitter, we're gonna to have to email, we're gonna to have to go district wide, it's gonna to have to be site specific. Um, we're gonna to have to start looking at those, those calls to see who didn't reply or pick up and figure out how we utilize parent community involvement specialized to get into individual parents. It's, it's gonna to have to be all on, hands on deck to let people know this, this our intent to return and how we're going to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm even thinking like some door to door, especially for some people who are not answering. I'm like, sign me up. Um, I mean it. Um, yeah, I think uh, our our communication is going to have to be extra intentional because this this past year is people experience something that you know they've never experienced in their lifetime, and so. Right. Um, yeah. Thank all you. Right. Thank you all. Thank you. Any other board member comments? Uh, no. Bruce, do you have any comments? All right. Okay. Thank you all uh, staff as uh, present this uh, update on novel coronavirus. And uh, move on to 11.02, discussion and action of board members' compensation, adjustment to compensation per education code 35120. Mr. Glenn Bendesey. Yes, this comes uh, before you. This is a discussion and for your action regarding adjustments to comp uh, compensation per ed code. So this is an, an ed function of ed code. Uh, there is a recommendation that the Board of Trustees can, um, can entertain regarding a 5% increase per board members compensation to take effect in July. Um, that would result in a new monthly compensation of 56284. Um, the financial impact of that is about $26.80 per board member per month. That's a lot of money, right? So this, this is the 5% is also just, again, a cap and a function of ed code. And so um, this comes before you and you all can um, um, take the recommendation and approve that increase um, or... Any board member, any motion? Madam President, there is public comment on this item. Oh, okay, go ahead, please. Uh, this is from Julio Pardo, staff member on item 11.02. And the statement is as follows. I was wondering when this type of item would come before the board. I am speaking for myself, not a, as an individual, not as the president of chapter 187 East Foothills. I have seen how much work this board puts into the running of this district. You all changed your meeting times in order to make sure you could take care of all that goes into the running of Eastside Union High School District. In doing so, you have more than doubled the time you work for us. As such, I personally am okay with this increase in compensation. Thank you, Julio Pardo. All right, Remember Herrera? Well, just for those that aren't aware, um, the district, I mean, the board actually used to have much more compensation except that Per the Ed Code, when our enrollment declined below, I forget what the figure was, 25,000 enrollment or something like that, our, we lost, what, about 40% of our monthly compensation, which isn't a lot to start with. And ever since then, we've just been getting these increments that the state code allows, and we're still nowhere near what, what it used to be, you know. And we joke among ourselves when we get caught in long meetings with difficult issues that, well, that's why they pay us the big bucks, you know? So this is so modest <laughs> and uh, it feels like an appreciation. So I really do 
um, appreciate Julio Pardo's statement. Thank you. I'll, I'll move for approval. Give me one second. First of all, I want to thank um, Mr. Pardo for his comment. Uh, and perhaps I might be in the minority here, but I, I'm, I'm generally uncomfortable with the idea of giving ourselves a race. If it was someone else doing it and they feel it that way, I'd be a little bit more comfortable. But uh, because it's ourselves, I'm uncomfortable. And I, I just want to share that I will be voting no on this. And it's up to my colleagues how they, they, they will vote. I will respect your decision either way, but I do want to be honest and upfront that I, I'll be voting no on uh, increasing our compensations. So there um, is a motion. Is there a I second? A can I? Oh. Um, it's moved by board member Rara. Anyone has a second? I didn't hear anyone second. Yeah, yeah I too feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying that, yes. So I also will be voting no, but um, we can get to that when we get to the vote. Right. Well, cur currently, there's only a, a, a motion. So I'll withdraw motion. the motion. But Thank you. Yeah, but there's no second. And so if there's no second, there would be no further discussion or nor a vote on the item. Board member Patty Cotisi. I, um, I don't have a strong feeling about it one way or another. So I too appreciate Julio's comment and obviously none of us does this for the $495 a month. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, Absolutely not. I mean, and the increment is tokens. Yeah, 26 so, dollars. And the only mechanism for it is a board action. It's like not a third party action. So we're just gonna have a board that doesn't believe in even a, a token action. You know, so, all right, thank you. All right, uh, we have, uh, you withdraw your motion? Yeah, did. Did it? Oh, so okay. So All it right. dies so on lack died. of, died. Oh, okay. Okay, so a motion by a rare not second. Withdrawn. Withdrawn, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, okay, withdrew. I apologize. <laughs> okay, then uh, I still have to call, uh, no, okay. All right. Okay, let's move to 12.01. Presentation, discussion, and action regarding 2021 California Accountability Dashboard Local Indicators. Teresa Marcus, Associate Superintendent, Education Services. Kristen King, Director of Assessment Accountability. And Marta Guerrero, Director of Instruction. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Board of Trustees, as part of the overarching uh, local control and accountability plan process, we are required to present our local indicator measures uh, to our community at a public meeting. So tonight, uh, Director of Assessment and Accountability, Kirsten Keene, will share the information with you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, uh, everybody. Nice to be here in person. Uh, no more uh, Zoom presentations for me. So cool. I uh, appreciate that. Um, so tonight we're going to talk to you about the local indicators, which are part of the data that districts are required to post on um, this, the California Accountability Dashboard. So we're going to walk you through that tonight. Um, <clears throat> So as always, we like to frame everything within the scope of East Side Equitable Communities. And what you're gonna see tonight is that the local indicators are fully aligned actually with our mission of equitable East Side Communities. And you will see how um, they actually connect in and support all of our efforts in that area. So we are actually, um, required to present our local indicators at a public regular board meeting. Uh, the board, it's just presented, the board doesn't have to approve the item, but we are required to present it and um, have possible discussion. Um, we also need to do it in conjunction with the LCAP. And you're gonna see tonight that all, all of the metrics of the local indicators were included 
in the metrics and goals of the LCAP. So they're um, intertwined and supportive of each other. Then, oops. I was gonna make sure I make that 19 minute timeline. Okay, you keep me going. All right. Um, so anyway, we then have to post it on the dashboard and where the other dashboard indicators get that nice little gauge that changes colors depending on how well you do. The local indicators simply get a status of met or not met and you're met if you post. So the only way you get not met is by not doing what you're supposed to do and putting it up there, essentially. Okay. So the, the um, local indicators in all of the dashboard um, indicators are fully aligned with the local accountability, um, local control funding formula, eight state priorities. And this slide simply illustrates in pink are the local indicator areas and in blue or black outline are Um, are the public data dashboard indicators like the, you know, the graduation rate, college and career readiness, suspension rate. And what you will see, priority one, priority two, and um, priority three are all local indicators, but we have priority seven and priority six. Thank you. Um, are a combination of local indicator and the public data. So for example, priority six on school climate, we use a local climate survey as well as the suspension rate data. So that this slide is just indicating that alignment with the, the eight state priorities. Next one. So this is a shot of what the dashboard looked like in 2019, because this year in for the 2020 dashboard, they really didn't post anything. They have some data up there, but because of the changes the pandemic caused, there, there weren't public data points to be able to update on there. So this slide shows you really where the local indicators are found on the dashboard, and it's right on the front, and they're outlined in pink. And if somebody were to go to our dashboard and click on the local indicator, that would give them more information, and we're about to see what that information would be. Okay, and that's what we post. So for priority number one, this is appropriately assigned teachers access to curriculum lined instruction materials and clean, safe and functional facilities. So this is just simply a ranking that aligns with our SARC. We had zero misassignment of teachers of English language learners, uh, zero uh, teacher misassignments. We had four teacher vacant positions. These are the qu required elements that we must post. So we had no choice on, on these data points. Um, we had 100% of our students with instructional materials. And um, you can see that we had very good ratings for our facilities. And that, that comes from the FIT report that facilities do every year. In addition to the specific data points, districts have the option to add additional comments and to clarify. This year, the um, CDE suggested that we use that as an opportunity to bring in some changes that occurred within the district due to COVID-19 and our responses to the COVID-19. So in this one, um, it, it was an additional comment regarding how we had uh, facilitated access to standards aligned material and instruction for students this year during distance learning. So this one talks about Chromebook, issuing Chromebooks to all students, Wi-Fi hotspots to families that need them. Um, we purchased, we're gonna add this actually, we forgot it. We, we purchased and activated digital licenses for all of our curriculum and textbooks. We purchased software to allow science teachers to do uh, virtual simulation labs, things like that. So we're gonna post that as part of the comments for this one. We'll have an additional comment on the next slide where it talks about our response to facilities. So upgrading HVAC systems, training and updating our new cleaning routines, the availability of san sanitary, um, you know, hand sanitizer, cleanliness, 
um, items, safety items within our school structures. So we're going to add those comments. The, the software you're referring to is CK12 and Pivot Online for the science classes. Oh my gosh, Teresa. Yes, for science, we use uh, CK12, um, and one of the lab simulations was uh, Labster um, for the science teachers to use. We also had a number of our different textbooks that, are, that uh, historically haven't been online. We digitized them and were able to put them on our online um, textbook library for access by our students. For all classes? Yes, all classes had um, access to digitized electronic uh, textbooks. Thank you. So area two is the implementation of state academic standards. And this particular item, the state provides districts a reflection tool that we are supposed to use and complete. And then we post that data. So Martha Guerrero, our director of instructional services, worked in conjunction with the SACs to complete an analysis of uh, where we are in terms of Im the implementation of, of the state academic standards, the areas that the state asks us to focus on, our, um, our professional development on the state standards, our alignment of our instructional materials, um, our practices and on improving uh, in terms of our instruction alignment to the um, standards and then implementation of some of the other subject areas like CTE, health, PE, BAPA, and then um, the identification of any adult learning needs that we need to improve upon in order to move forward with this. And so what you see, oh, <laughs> what you what you see is that we are in the initial and um, full implementation but we haven't really moved over into five and the areas that you see that we have the lower ratings it's because we've had it like a change in framework or new health uh, framework standards new math framework so we're just in the beginning processes of that so really the big, the biggest takeaway for us is in our work that we're doing around standards alignment. David mentioned it earlier when he did his presentation and Martha has been working with the subject area coordinators on um, indicating the priority standards in all of the different subject areas for um, staff teachers to focus on in their instruction so that we know students are getting the core content that they need to the depth that they need it so that they can move on to the next level prepared. Uh, the third priority is parent engagement. And um, this one is very much connected to the LCAP. We use the LCAP surveys, uh, Teresa, did this one and we also uh, utilized the parent forums in conjunction with the LPAC to get some of the feedback on this. The, again, the state provides a rubric to us that we must address the particular areas and we have to address the areas of building relationships between school staff and families, building partnerships for student outcomes and seeking input for decision making and they give us a scale. And so each of the next slides show us uh, where, um, based on the feedback from the surveys and the parent forums, we are in our process of doing this. So you can go to the next slide. So this one is building relationships, and um, we fall in mostly the initial and full implementation phase on this. The next slide is building um, partnerships. Uh, for, is that what that said? Okay, for, <laughs> sorry, let's see that far. Um, for uh, student outcomes, improving student outcomes, we are in mostly the initial phase there. And in the last slide, it's seeking uh, input for decision-making from parents. And we fall into uh, the two and three categories. So that is the lowest category. I don't Teresa, did you want to mention something about this? And when we get to the next one. Okay. So when, um, 
There we go. This will be what we start talking about. We're going to post extra onto the dashboard to um, talk about our areas of strength, areas of weakness, and our intentions for improving things. So, go ahead. Yeah, so particular to this one, even though the LCAP survey uh, from the parents that submitted it uh, demonstrated a high satisfaction with our outreach in inviting them to participate in advisory groups and decision making process, we know. Um, within our own self-reflection and looking at this, that that's an area of growth for us um, because we do not include necessarily all our, our underserved families and being able to provide those opportunities for them. Um, and so even when you look at some of the surveys that we've brought forth to you uh, as a board of trustees, we tend to be high at certain schools in terms of response rates, but not necessarily at um, across the board um, with an equal distribution um, represented in our surveys. And so although the parents that reported reported a level of high satisfaction, we recognize that there's still need for us to do better outreach for our families to particularly be involved in the decision making process um, when it comes to our policies and our practices and how we respond as a system. Well, I have a question on that. Thank you for noting that because we don't have to, but I think this qualitative data is just as important as the quantitative. Where, where is that going to go? Like, is that going to be part of some goals or is that just something that's top of mind as we think about this upcoming school year? Yeah, so that actually speaks to all our goals within our LCAP. So if you look back to the LCAP goals, right, if we're to increase our graduation rate, if we're to increase our A3G completion rate, if we're to increase our attendance rates, if we're to increase how we be, respond to behaviors, it, it's got to involve our parents. Right, And so within each of those elements, we're going to make sure that we're doing better outreach and that we're better utilizing our parent community and involvement specialists and being able to be more aligned with the work that they do across the sites to develop common assurances as to what does it mean to be a parent and community involvement specialist mm -hmm. and what does it mean to really do outreach across our school sites so that our parents are not only to responding to service, but they're actually active participants in the decision making process. One of the main um, areas of growth for us in Ed Services is we have a um, DAC DLAC advisory group that we really need to do a better job of making sure that there's representation from each of our school sites of the parents that need to be there, um, which are parents of our English learners, which yep. um, have not been necessarily actively involved. And so that's a big push and that's a huge action item for us to meet the five goals within our outcome. I love that. I love that. Thank you. Sorry, Kirsten. No, no. <laughs> I was We'd already talked, but we wanted her to talk on this one. Um, priority six is school climate. And normally uh, the, the state allows districts to go ahead and use the California Healthy Survey, but that survey is only required every two years and it's only given to a limited number for us. It's just two grade levels of students. So since 2018, we have implemented the Panorama survey, which we have the ability to offer at multiple times during the year. So we give it in the fall and in the spring, we can give it to all students, staff and community. So, and we can change questions when we need to, to um, align with our areas of focus on any given year. For example, this past year, we shifted some questions so they were appropriate and timely for distance learning and things that we needed to know there. The state asks us to address school connectedness, safety, and um, the climate for support for academic learning and knowledge and fairness of uh, rules and discipline. So those are the areas that we're gonna be focusing on and reporting out on. You wanna go to the next slide. So this slide is, is, contains the information that we're posting, but we're only posting the dark blue um, data. We included the lighter blue data because they were supporting components of the larger topic areas and we thought the board might be interested in seeing some of the more detailed um, survey results in those areas. Also wanted to explain to you what would safety look like when we are in a distance learning environment and um, in that particular category we changed it to focus on safety in online environment and online bullying, things like that, harassment, um, postings on social media, things like that. Well, just to, and just to clarify for my colleagues, I was a little confused when I read this 
because at first I thought 86% of students had experienced lies spread about you on social media, et cetera. But it says, during the past 12 months, how many times have you had mean rumors, had whatever, these experiences? So the 86, 85, and 89% mean zero. They had a zero experiences this and, oh, right? Exactly. Yes. I, so I just wanted to clarify that because I was confused when I read it too. Well, that's good feedback. Maybe we'll change how we post the information. Okay. So um, we'll post it to be more explicit and exact what the response was. So, okay, thank you for that feedback. I did not want that yet, only because I just wanted to focus on the fact that our lowest category was in school connectedness at only 17%, which is sort of expected in an, a distance learning and online environment, but I do want to highlight it because it is a main focus. It's something we've been talking about. Glenn talked about it. Teresa's talked about it um, and how we're going to be welcoming students back when they do come back in person in the fall. And that's a big concern. So that is an important metric for us to be watching. So we will be discussing the higher level data points. I will explain it, change around how we post the data. And um, it's really important, I think, that we also bring in our implementation of MTSS and our response with our uniform behavior response system in hopes that we will be able to improve um, on our fair and consistent discipline practices and our responses to student needs. The last area is access to a broad course of study. And in this one, districts have the freedom to pick certain areas, but they ask us to address these, address them in these four ways. So the first one is about um, access. We look at uh, data that talks about that access. How are we gonna measure it? Identify barriers and then actions to improve upon that. So the next slide uh, shows us the barrier, uh, the <clears throat> topics that we chose to look at. So when we uh, chose to look at English language learner access to third year of English, math and science, math and science third year is college um, preparatory necessary for college entrance. And then we also wanted to look at English learner enrollment in AP and access to general education or the least restrictive environment for our students with disabilities. When we look at the data, we see that between 35 and 40% of our English language learners are accessing that third level English college preparatory course, math or science. We see that only 9.5% of our English language learners are enrolled in at least one AP course, AP slash IB course. And that only 30.4% of our students with disabilities access general education courses for 80% or more of their instructional day. And you've heard all of these in conjunction with the LCAP already that Teresa has presented to you. Um, the, some of the barriers we've identified is course passage in the prerequisite coursework to the third year and lack of instructional and timely interventions to occur so that students are passing those classes with the rigor necessary to be successful down the road in that third year. And then uh, policies and placement practices for students with disabilities in general education. And moving forward, we um, want to be able to look at professional development and the use of teaching strategies, UDL accommodations, modifications for learners in general, not just English language learners and students with disabilities, and um, developing those uh, common assurances around the priority standards and reflective practices to ensure students have the foundations that they need. And then of course, the work that we have begun this year with ninth graders around placement of our students with disabilities. And the next slide is questions. And I guess I went a little bit over. Well, uh, you got an extra two minutes because Teresa, you know, jumped in. So. <laughs> <laughs>
No, thank you, Kristen Kring, for your presentation. This is very comprehensive presentation and uh, actually it's a lot of works when you compose all of those information data and to uh, present it to us. I have uh, one quick question on the access to a broad course of study. How do you, um, you mentioned the number three identification of barriers, the, the slide before this slide of question, mm -hmm. yeah. Identification of barrier, um, you mentioned about lack of timely instructional interventions. Can you clarify that for me? Because I'm still have uh, not clear. How do you going to, you know, clarify on instructional interventions? Well, I can take a stab and then I'll let <laughs> Teresa talk about it. But so timely interventions would be, for example, we talked about the early warning system report and students get progress reports, you know, at each marking period before they actually come to their semester grade. So as soon as that student is getting that D or getting that F, even if it's prior to the grading period, what type of supports and intervention is happening within that classroom that the, the shifts that the teacher is making to make the uh, instruction and curriculum accessible to those students in a way that is going to help them pass the course. So that's just a brief way to talk about timely intervention for students. So during that time, do you um, contact or engage the parents, you know, to support the student, you know, when they fail those classes or, you know, any other intervention? Exactly. So, the, and that's going to be the huge pieces of work that we're gonna be doing next year as we implement um, further and deeper within the MTSS system work that we're doing. And we're hiring a whole bunch of support staff at MTSS coordinators, English language learner coordinators, mm -hmm. our inclusion specialists to be working with teachers and helping facilitate that process of wrapping around and figuring out what is going wrong and what types of supports that we need to put in place so that more students are aware. Thank you. I'm so, absolutely. And if I may, I just want to add one thing. I think the important piece here is how we have been defining intervention. I think a lot of times we define intervention as something that happens outside of the classroom, mm -hmm. um, whether it's at home or after hours. We really have to look at how do I, as a teacher in that moment, intervene with the student based on the formative data that I'm getting um, as I'm doing my teaching so that then I can adjust and get at that intervention in that moment. Awesome, right. Any other comments from the board? This is just amazing. I'm looking at this and this is detailed, like further breaking down from like our big goals. And I'm like, oh my God, even this is like huge. And so I, I am so excited to see how all of this pans out, especially with the additional resources that we're putting into, um, into place this year. I've been seeing a lot of those hires happen. I'm like, oh my God, this is this is really happening. So I really want I really want to see um, updates here, updates um, as this uh, school year um, progresses to see how all these amazing things are playing a role in the lives of our kids and our community, especially this year coming back from the pandemic. It's it's going to be crucial. So just a lot of gratitude to to the team for for all of this work. Great, excellent, good job, team. All right, no other comments, then uh, we move to 13.01, discussion and action to approve the contract for professional services over 25,000. I know this is a routine one. Um, I had a couple of questions about, uh, we have a, a ton of contracts on here. Correct. And uh, I did have a couple of questions do you have a question on 13.01? One written comment. There is public comment also on 13.01. Okay. Well, let's so that's in, like listen me to, read to public, the, yeah, yeah, public, public comments. comments. Uh, this is from Julio Pardo, President CSEA, staff member, item 13.01, and it's written as follows. I am speaking on the 46th entity on the list for this agenda item. The district signed an MOU with CSEA Chapter 187 East Foothills back in 2017 agreeing to give a report showing how the district was saving money through this outside contract. At the time, we, CSEA, felt there was another solution to this issue. We have not received those reports. I do not place fault on Mr. Chris Jew as we, we 
were not a party to this agreement. Two years ago, we received incomplete information after we had reminded the district of its obligation. No such report came last year for which blame may go to the pandemic. We request that the district provide us the information requested as per our MOU of 2017 on this item. Board member Trostak, the address. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, I noticed that there were many, many contracts and references to the K through 12 strong workforce CTE grant. And um, with lots of different partners and um, some obvious, some not so obvious, and I just thought I don't. This, I don't want a presentation on this, but just like a couple, like just the thirty thousand two minute overview of what this grant is and where it comes from and things like how our partners are involved, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So the this is one of our largest CTE grants that we um, submit and compete for, and it has to be done in partnership with um, various entities, including our community colleges, such as Mission College, San Jose City. Um, and because we are named as a fiscal agent, although it is a partnered grant, then we um, share our the funding, the grant funding through a contract, we're a pass through um, as part of the, the grant requirements. And so then this is our contract with them to give them their portion of the funding for their projects, which also serve ours because we have dual enrollment courses, we have articulated courses, uh, but it's essentially a pass through grant. So these, so some of our partners are elementary school districts. So kids start with CTE programs that they continue when they get with us. No, right? these are partners. Most of the partners here for the CTA, the strong workforce are community colleges. I thought I saw Franklin McKinley in there. Um, for CTE as part of the- K twelve. I thought it was a pass through for K-12. Yes, yes, that one is. It's, it's part of our- um, a partnership for developing our pathway from some of our feeder schools into it. So yes, I apologize. Yeah, you're I've correct. Got it. Okay. And the funding comes from who? Where? Um, the state. It's part of the grant competition, you know, the, the competitive grants that we submit as part of the creating more career technical education pathways. Um, and so there's different ones. We have Perkins grants, for example, we have um, the strong workforce, we have a CTEC grant that we're going to be reapplying um, now that the pandemic is over and that we've included CTE as part of our LCAP. So it's a, a competitive grant and how long does it last? Um, this one is a renewal and I think this one is a five-year grant I want to say. I'd have to check with Tim, our, our career services director. He's, he takes lead on that. Um, 30 months um, is actually, he's just uh, sent me a message. It's 30 months. Great. They're Thank listening. You. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Um, Great, and I also noticed that we have a couple of providers that will be doing online tutoring for our students. And I was curious about what's the difference because so you have Paper Education Company and Princeton Review, and that would be tutor.com, but they both seemed like they were kind of doing the same thing based on the description, but. Yeah, so tutor.com, we're actually, we're gonna be ending that contract. The better service is paper.com for us. And so we're going to expand the services to all our students through the paper one, which has a greater um, response and flexibility and their customer service was far better than the Princeton review one. And so we're gonna uh, end our Princeton review, which is a tutor.com and shift over to paper. Okay, great. Um, and then my last question on that um, 1301 is, um, so I noticed that we have a contract with the college board, but, um, I also know during the pandemic that the SAT was suspended, right? Mm -hmm. And it was. That there's actually been talk about like, do we even need it at all, like mm -hmm. in the future? So yeah, so it's in conversation. And for some of our, our, our classes, even this upcoming um, graduating class, um, they're not requiring it. But in having just as a parent gone through the application process is interesting because they still ask for it, even though they're not necessarily um, requiring it. Um, and so for us, it's continuing to provide that opportunity for our students so that they can be as competitive as possible, even though they're not requiring, quote unquote, that um, exam. It also does provide students with an opportunity to have another data point uh -huh. as to their college uh, readiness and preparedness to engage with co co college level work, because that's really what the intent of the, uh, these uh, standardized tests is, right, is to look at students 
through level of preparedness that's based on the standardized tests uh, toward being able to be successful in, at college work. So this contract is actually to provide for us to get have our students take the PSAT, which is the pre- The PSAT and the SAT, the, the oh, way the college SAT. board works, yeah, you have to have two exam administrations in order to get the rate and the contract that they need you to. Um, we're still in conversations with them to see if it actually is going to happen based on whatever public health mm -hmm. guidelines um, happen to be put in place, but we wanted to make sure that we brought it forth so that we can um, have those conversations and be able to, as needed, pursue the contract if we're able to actually administer the test um, as it okay. has been. So in the this past. is something we may or may not do, but we're Correct. just approving it. So it's you have it available if you choose to. Correct. Go. Being that this is the last board meeting and we need it to make sure that we prepare for the fall. OK, great. So with that, I second. I think we still need a second. OK, I have one quick question uh, for Navians uh, Inc. Um, you know, I don't mind to support, but I'd like to see the report uh, from, you know, from last year, how many students, how many parents uh, did use, you know, Navians and compare with this year, because I mm. like to see the trend, you know, how, how did we do? I mean, if we did not do really well from this company, maybe we were looking for another company. So I think it's, uh, I'm looking for staff yep. to bring back the report so I can understand a little bit more. Uh, you know, for the contract, like mental health and other services, I think is is very good, very important for our community as well as our East Side District. But like, I I want staff to look into, you know, bring back the report to see how do we do, and when we appoint, are we approve those report or those services? Uh, did we gain anything, or did we improve any services to support our student? That's my comments. We'll do, thank you. All right, so we have a motion approved by Board Vice President Herrera, second by Board Member Patty Cotizzi. I want to ask Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. All right, if um, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 No aye. objection, no abstention. And this item 13.01 has passed unanimously. All right, move to 13.02, adopt resolution 2020 slash 2021-37 and contract CSPP-1557-00, California State Preschool Program. Mr. Chris Chu, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, so before the board tonight is a resolution and an action to uh, renew the funding contract for our state preschool, pro I mean, our, our state preschool program. Uh, the resolution is also to uh, identify uh, Glenn Vanderzee as our new superintendent as an authorized center uh, for the grant funding. Right. I need a motion, please. Move for approval. Second. Okay, moved by board member Chavez, second by board member Doe. Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. All right. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 No abstention, no option. This item 13.02 is passed unanimously. Move to 13.03, adopt resolution number 2020 slash 2021-38 and contract CCTR-1275-00, general child care and development. Yes, thank Mr. you again. Similarly to the last item, this item again is to uh, renew the annual contract for child care funding for the, uh, for the coming school year. And the resolution is also to identify Glenn Vanderzee as the new superintendent uh, as an authorized signer for the funding yep. contracts. Move for approval. I'm just curious, what's the difference between these two? two. Mm. Between the two items? The first item was for preschool funding. The second item here is for child care funding. Ah, I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. Uh, the motion was moved by board member Herrera, second by board member Doe. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 No abstention, no objection. The item 13.03 has passed uh, unanimously. Move to 13.04, adopt resolution 2020-2021-39, establish a student activity special revenue fund, 08. Mr. Chris Chu, please. Yes, thank you. Um, this item here uh, before the board tonight is to establish a new a financial fund within our accounting system. Um, under the current governmental accounting standards board or GATSBY, 
they recently approved uh, a new requirement for school districts to now include their associate student bodies or ASB financial uh, information within our current district's financial reports. So even though every year the auditor comes back and shares with you the results of their audit of the ASB accounts, the ASB financials really don't actually show up on our financial records. So under GASB 85, again, this requirement is for us to now include the like, example, like the fund balances for a student body uh, when we actually report to the state our, our, our financial records. So tonight we're asking the board to allow us to create a new fund number, which is fund 08 for our accounting system. So we so need this action, is, right? This is just a bookkeeping function and the ASBs will continue to have access to their accounts the way they have. Yes, yeah, so there wouldn't be any additional work or anything for the folks out at the school sites. As, as uh, board member Cortez is referring to, we utilize the program ASB Works. And so the integration of ASB Works with our now Munis financial system will transfer all that information now into our financial records. Move to approve. Okay. Second. Move, move by board uh, courtesy, second by um, board member Herrera. Uh, Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 No abstention, no objection. Item 13.04, pass unanimously. 13.05, discussion and action for superintendent or designate to award request for proposal during the summer. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will speak briefly to this item. Staff is asking the board for delegation of authority uh, to award contracts upon the final uh, review of two uh, current proposals uh, for bids for our child nutrition services. Uh, because our next board meeting uh, won't be until August, uh, that would delay us in our abilities to enter into contracts for these food service contracts. So we're asking the, the board to allow us and give us delegation authority and we will bring back the award of these contracts uh, to, the, to the actual bidders um, in, in August when we, when we come back. Right. Move for approval. Second. Moved by board Chavez, uh, second by board member Joe. Bruce, how do you vote? I, I approve. All, right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 No abstention, no objection. Or pass unanimously for 13.05. Um, 13.06, <laughs> discussion and action to approve summer delegation of authority to award emergency contracts. Mr. Christian. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is an item that we routinely bring back to the board every summer. Um, staff is asking again, delegation of authority for the super, with the superintendent and being able to confer with the board president in the event that there is some emergency that transpires over the summer that requires us to enter into a contract immediately. So we are asking again, the board uh, to, to delegate this authority to the superintendent and to the board president to award a contract over the summer in the event of an emergency. Questions, is there a, um, a maximum dollar amount? Um, there is not a, a dollar amount listed on the board item tonight, no. And this is something that we approve every year kind of pro forma, and we've never gone into an issue of what is a cap, just emergency related. Yeah. If there's a fire, if something has to be authorized and handled immediately, it's all emergency contents. Understood. I need a motion. Okay. Second. All right. Um, Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. Um, Mary, you get the... Uh, Moved by board member Joe, second by board member Cortesi. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstention? Any objection? I'm seeing none. The item 13.06 has passed unanimously. Move to 13.07, discussion and action to adopt resolution 2020-2021-42 regarding education protection account EPA. The same routine one, Mr. Ju. Yes, thank you. Um, this is a, a yearly routine item that, that we bring before the board every year. Uh, as you recall, the education protection account uh, is tied back to Proposition 30 that was, that was passed in 2012 
that created a, a, a new tax on the, the upper tax at the upper higher earning wage earners in the state. And under Proposition 30, it created a special account that was a set aside funding for education and that was referred to the education protection account under Proposition 30. And as a requirement of that proposition, those funds were put into the special account for education and for purposes that school boards would then determine or have a plan to spend those dollars. But the reality is that those dollars did not provide any additional funding for school districts is all within the, the confines of Proposition 98 and the, the current funding that we would get. So this is really more of like a, a state accounting mechanism for them to account for these taxes that are set aside under the special provision under Proposition 30. But for the action that we have to take tonight is that we have to submit a plan every year in terms of how we spend those dollars. And uh, before you is our recommendation is that we spend these dollars always on teacher salaries and benefits. And so that is really the action we are asking the board tonight to uh, approve this recommendation to uh, continue to spend those, those dollars that we, were get on, that we receive under this prop special proposition in the fashion toward teacher salaries and benefits. Okay, Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. Thank you. Um, all in favor, please say hi. Aye. 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 Any objection, any abstention? This item passed unanimously. So we move to 14.01, discussion and action to approve addendum to August 6, 2020, memorandum of understanding between California School Employee Association and is as East Fruits Hills Chapter 187 and ISA Union High School District regarding return impacts and effect on the CSEA bargaining unit. Mr. Van Der Zee? I believe there's public comment on this item. And if we could read that, I, that, correct. that might just do the trick for us. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, this is submitted by Julio Pardo, president of CSEA on item 14.01. And it is written as follows. Before speaking on this item, I would like to let the board know that I am sorry for missing this last meeting. I had every intent to be here, but circumstances prevented it. It was quite a long ordeal to get this MOU done due to circumstances mostly caused by the pandemic shutdown, but we did finish. I would like to thank my team, Patty Alarcon, Rodney Satsatin, Phil Samura, Bani Estrada, Brenda Flores, Flora Neal, Lori Elman, and our labor rep, Robin James Udegaard, Thanks to the district team led by Mr. Glenn Vanderzee and Ms. Carrie Vape. Although we did struggle with certain items, the discussions were always held in a cordial and professional manner. I only hope our discussions on a successor agreement to our collective bargaining agreement go as well next year. For now, I urge the board to accept and approve this MOU. Thank you for your attention. That concludes public comment. I think the district feels similarly to uh, the comments by CSAA and just this was a difficult time, but we managed to work together to get it done and we recommend your approval. Awesome. Move for, oh. yeah. okay, moved by our board member Doe, second by board Chavez. Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any objection? Aye. Any abstention? None. This item passed unanimously. Move to 14.02. Discussion and action to approve administrative regulation 4117.11, reduce workload. Mr. Move Vendor, for approval. I'll oh, second. All right, move by board member Herrera, second by board member Kotizi. Uh, Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any objection, any abstention? I'm seeing none. This item passed unanimously. Move to 14.03, discussion and action to approve request for reduced workload program for 2021-2022 school year. Yeah, 1404. 1403. 1403. 1403 first. I have not, I, we, we, oh, we just missed 1404. 1402. Okay, so moved by board member Doe, second by board member Herrera. Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. Oh. Okay, right. Bruce, Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any objection? Any objections? Abstention? None. Then this item passed unanimously. 
Okay, move to 14.04, discussion and action approved increase to the hourly rate of pay for college aides. I'll move to approve. This is, we're bringing our college aides to minimum wage. That's not <laughs> even, I, right? I know. Finally, I know. that's the only Finally. answer. Finally. Okay, so uh, yeah. Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. All right. All in favor, please say a hi. Aye. 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 Any objection, any abstention? None. This item passed unanimously. 14.05, discussion and action to ratify District of Servants of 1st Juneteenth Federal Holiday on June 18, 2021. We already passed this. Second. All right. Uh, Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any objections, any abstention? None. This item passed unanimously. Move to 15.01, discussion and consideration and action regarding the selection, appointment of members to Citizen Bond Oversight Committee for Measure G, E, I, Technology, I, and Z. Board Member Patty Cotizzi. Yeah, so uh, Board Member Doe and I were on a committee to review the applicants to our Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. So the board does not play an active role in the bond, Citizens Bond Oversight Committee, except we do appoint the members. And so uh, through working with the uh, CBOC member, Patrick Trainer, mm -hmm. uh, we are recommending the appointment of Dr. Barry Schimmel, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, but um, he has served in the past. So yeah. He's a, he's a huge asset. Yeah, he's a tremendous asset. Definitely so. a wealth of knowledge. So we're very blessed that he's willing to serve. And so our recommendation is to approve that appointment. Move for approval. All right, Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any objection, any abstention? This item passed unanimously. Move to 15.02, discussion and action to approve the bond capital projects contract over 50,000. Move to approve. Second. Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any objection, any abstention? I've seen none, this item passed unanimously. Move to 15.03, discussion and action to approve plan increment two and amendment one with Roden Builders Inc. for the Silver Creek High School, new classroom building K and buildings J and T modernization. Mr. Christu. Yes, just real briefly. This is a second part of our design build uh, contract process. And so the board had previously approved the um, contract with Rodan Builders uh, for the Silver Creek uh, projects. And so tonight we are bringing forward a recommendation to approve the second, second increment of the contract now to incorporate the construction of the work. I need a motion or any question? Second. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Bruce. Oh, Bruce, how do you vote? I'm sorry. I approve. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any objection, any abstention? No one has any comments. This item passed unanimously. Move to 15.04, discussion and action to approve third amendment to funding agreement between the city of San Jose and the Eastside Union High School District relating to installation of community wireless network in the district. For approval. Second. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. Thank you. Who was the second? Who second? Mr. Doe or, or board member Chavez? Doe. 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 Okay. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any objection? Any abstention? Seeing none, this item passed unanimously. Number 15.05 discussion and action to update board and delegate authority to approve agreement to the city of San Jose for providing community wireless services to additional neighborhoods. Move for approval. Second. All right, Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any objection, any abstention? None. The item passed unanimously. We want, uh, we will go to consent action calendar section 16. Madam President, I move for approval of consent calendar. Second. Second. Oh, Bruce second. Um, All right. Member Chavez. Member Chavez second. Bruce, how do you vote? I approve. Thank you. 
All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. objection? Aye. Any abstention? None. This aye. consent calendar passed unanimously. So now we move to 21, written report 21.01. Um, item under section 21, a written report that received into the public record. No action is taken by the board. Board member or superintendent may put any item for discussion or request an item to be placed on agenda for discussion and action at future meeting. So uh, 21.02 is received quarterly report on the County of Santa Clara Treasury Investment Portfolio as of March 31, 2021. Any comment, anyone know? All right, this is just a report. Thank you, uh, Mr. Christu. We move to 22 future agenda item. Opportunity for board of trustees to request item on future agendas. I like to request a report for HVAC for all site uh, in our district, maybe next fall semester um, to bring back to the board. I would like to revisit that. We'll do that. Um, earlier, you mentioned a report on Navians. Would I would, I'd include that also as a future item? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other board member has any other item? Yeah, similarly to um, previous years, I'd love to um, have continuous dialogue around LCAP instructional goals, um, especially with our um, new focuses this year. I am really excited to hear more about the parent piece as well um, in reference to, to our goals. Uh, along those lines, I actually was really intrigued by the um, conversation tonight around the parent piece of the dashboard and was um, wondering if we could actually just maybe sneak in uh, if we have a study session or something and you need like an extra item or maybe a short presentation at a meeting but I'd love to hear more about our parent engagement strategies and you know like what does it look like at full implementation. I echo to if I may follow up on that comment, I'd love to see uh, improvements and uh, return on investments when, when appropriate. Uh, if it's parent engagement, I'd love to see how we improve from previous years and how our usage. And if we are talking about the LCAP or the technology span that uh, more person Leigh has spoke about, I'd love to see some form of, you know, how, how do we use tutor.com, for example, and whether there's some sort of return on investment from the academic standpoint. I also echo with uh, board member Kwatizi that I'd like to see um, maybe a, a, a report uh, from uh, PCS. How do they engage parents? How do they help you know, uh, parents to be involved in the school side? Because I know that board member Travis and I, we're very interested to bring back you know, the parent from Latino, community from Vietnamese community so we can understand and how can we support them so they can support their student. So I think I'd like to echo a little bit more on that. I think this group just designed a study session. So we'll, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll find a way to coordinate that, so find the overlaps, get that and, and put some sure. direction to that. Awesome. All right. Okay. Any I have another uh, one. one more item? Oh, yeah, please uh, board chat. So and, um, uh, this is, uh, this is I'm not sure. Well, I'm just going to put this out there. I'm not sure if this is something that we need board consensus on or because it costs money. But um, I was reading um, something from the county office that um, pointed to Evergreen Elementary School District and Mount Pleasant School District have lost 20% of their enrollment. And we know also, I don't, they didn't give a percentage from Alum Rock, but we know that they are losing students rapidly too because they're closing um, a couple of schools, I believe this coming fall. And I'm wondering if we, it's been several years now since we commissioned a demographic study, but I wonder if we want to do that so we can really see when that is gonna hit us. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know if we, if it's, if, if we're still sufficiently um, informed by the last one, or um, I don't know, it just seemed like the data in this county office report was um, more tangible than what, I, what we saw in our last demographic study. So I just, I just put that out there. 
I comment real quickly on that. So I appreciate that comment. Um, actually, staff has engaged. We actually uh, asked the board for approval to commission uh, a demographic update. So we are working with a demographer to update that. So we will have that information for us in the fall. Can you clarify what that demographic studies would be including in that studies? Pardon? What will we include in that study? So mainly looking at right now the, the current trends in terms of birth rate to kids that are moving through the feeder system that they that when that by the time they get to our, 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 our level, what our enrollment will look like. And obviously taking into consideration uh, the housing, the high cost of housing, the loss of enrollment that we are seeing with the charter schools, uh, all of those factors will, will go into this updated dem demographer study as far as what our projected enrollment will be. Thank you. All right, no more board comments. So we move to 22.03, just annual government calendar. And we will not have a board retreat this weekend. Uh, because we're going to move to another date. So move to 23.01, um, the board trustee communication and comments. Uh, I would like to say that um, thank you, you know, administrator, teachers, staff, everyone has been worked very hard in the fiscal year 2020. And I know that uh, we will have uh, one month uh, break from our board trustee. But I know the administrator is still going to have to work. But uh, appreciate uh, you take the time, you know, for all the teachers and staff. You take the time for the family for summer, and I think this is, you know, it's a time that we re-energize it, and we will come back stronger at reopening in August. And I uh, went to visit YB and talk to Mr. Gerardo Zunaga, a physics teacher at YB, and I want to thank him. Uh, for the time that uh, he shared some comments with me. And uh, we were looking forward to, you know, working with our teachers. That's all I have. So I move to the, my next uh, well, vice president, Mr. Manuel Herrera. Um, I, I, I'm sure my board colleagues share the sense of relief in hearing that the state legislation passed mm -hmm. uh, with regards to uh, uh, protecting our students um, and um, what was the, the number of AB 104? AB 104 passed through the Senate is on the, yeah. Uh, so a tremendous sense of relief when we took the action that we took, we took it because we had uh, a high degree of confidence based on everything we'd been given to understand that this legislation would indeed pass. And at the same time, we were anxious, I think, and nervous, uh, be, you know, and now that it has passed, I think what's before us is to ensure that every student who has this option receives a direct communication and support. And I think there were 300 and something students that ended up with a, with a teacher uh, assigned F uh, and all of those students should have and their parents should, we need to be sure that they understand they have the right to file for a, for a no pass versus a, 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 an F grade. Um, and- I volunteer. And you volunteer. Be on the outreach team. Yeah. Same well, I, I think there needs to be some formal communication from the district to each parent and child. Um, I have one more item and I can't remember it. So why don't you keep going if I remember all. Come back. I, I just want to follow up on your comment while you think about your other thing you want to say. I'd love to have uh, direct and repeated communication to the students and parents so that they have that options uh, and the right to, uh, to, the, to uh, uh, have an, an NP or P as appropriate. All right, uh, board member Chavez. Just want to say thank you to to staff um, all across the district for an amazing year. What a hard year, but what a very successful year! And looking forward to um, this upcoming fall. All right, well, I, I do want to take this moment to thank um, demonstrations, the staff, and my colleagues for for giving me one an amazing six months on the board. Mm -hmm. And uh, you guys are incredible. 
And I thank you for this opportunity to serve the students and uh, the public in this community. But uh, this, this amazing experience would not be possible without each and every one of you. Thank you. But it was 12 months already. <laughs> <laughs> Board member Cortese, any comments? Just to echo the thanks and the looking forward to having our kiddos on campus in the fall. All right. Uh, 23.02, Bruce Nguyen, any comments? Yeah, no, it's been a pleasure working with the board and everyone in the district. Uh, I've learned several amazing things over these past few months. And of course, I will continue to pass it down to the future members and, and returning members of the Student Governing Board uh, about my own experiences too. And uh, I do hope to continue uh, my work you know, in uh, community service and um, just being out in the world, just helping other people. And, um, and I, I could say that, you know, this place is, this is, this is a wonderful place uh, in the East side. And I, I'm sure that it'll help um, every student that comes into it. Um, and yeah, my, my siblings will also come into it, my sisters. Uh, will be a sophomore next year. So, uh, you know, she's having a really great time at, at uh, the district. So um, that's what I can say. And, and for my brother who will eventually become a high schooler, he'll uh, have a really great time in the district as well. So thank you. Thank you for your service and you and your team has made a big difference in our district. So, but we will miss you. Uh, good luck and uh, come back and see us sometime. All right, so now we move to 23.03. Uh, Mr. Glenn Vandersee. Again, I wanna thank staff for the way they responded after March 13 and our students and our families in an unprecedented event. And the way we've learned, whether it's new technologies or new ways of logging on or some, what's a hot spot, who knew for some folk, uh, how to access our broadband within our neighborhoods. And one outcome of that is just how vital that service is like if we if we, how could we have done distance learning without that take it back a couple of decades how would we have done this without that and now how ubiquitous and necessary um, that service is and i'm i'm really uh proud of our board for taking steps and proud of our team for for putting that together i say that because with the challenge of returning from the pandemic, we're not returning to a normal. There's no just going back. We've learned things. We've learned things about ourselves. Uh, we've, we've learned that wellness really is something that's, that's real and needs to be addressed. And so in a planning for a return, I'm just, I'm just inviting and can't wait to partner with everybody on the east side to not put equitable communities to the side, but to double down on it. And the only way we're gonna return well is if we figure out how to welcome people as they are, how to read their strengths and weaknesses by behaviors or where they're at and responding and just be ready to read that behaviors as a form of information so that as Mr. Brown said, you know, you can react, you wanna respond, but our equitable communities doesn't just say respond, it says positively respond in a way that builds up each other, whether it's staff, 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 student, because we do want our students to be full participants in their schools and therefore in this valley. So I leave tonight at this last board meeting, still just acting as a superintendent, not even one, but really looking forward to engaging with all the, with our communities over the summer and in fall to really embrace what we've said we do and build these communities and let the returning from a pandemic just be our excuse to see things in a new way and an excuse to operate, have new habits of doing for the common assurances that lead to success. And I'm, I, I love this work and I love being in East Side because I think we have a community that wants to do that and will step up to do it. It's my firm belief. So thank you all. Awesome. Uh, the next item is 23.04 board meeting evaluation. I think if we done before 10 p.m., then we did a good job, folks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want to echo a little bit that uh, today I uh, went to uh, YB and I have to say that the this, this school side is really look good and very clean. And I saw the student play around the site and in the school um, and also the student that I attend the uh, uh, 
the um, when I talked to um, Mr. Gerardo uh, Zunaga in physics uh, class, and I saw the student is really working hard. So hopefully that when we go back to a normal session and would like to visit some other school site. So the next item is 24.01 is legal counsel will report on closed session actions. Please, Rogerio. Yes, closed session item 2.04, motion by member Cortesi, second by member Doe. The board approved the following appointments and employments. Uh, Hien Duan as associate principal, APED at Yerba Buena High School. Shelby Edwards is associate principal, APED at Evergreen Valley High School. Ricardo Salgado as associate principal, APA at Independence High School. Annis Short. Thomas as Associate Principal, APEB Oak Grove High School. Miriam Adelat as Coordinator of Student Services. Sandrine Legrand as Coordinator of Special Services at the Education Center and Enlin Wang as Fiscal and Budget Manager at the Education uh, Center. And uh, those approvals were all unanimous by the, by the board. There are no further actions to report. Thank you, uh, General Counsel Rohira Yohus. So now the meeting is adjourned and we will meet again August 5th, 2021 as regular board meeting. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.